Hello again, friends, and the NASDAQ is up, and you are <laughs> our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here on another sunny day. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. I don't know what we're going to talk about today, but there's always something and more with this man, the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. You sound like Mr. Rogers uh, hosting a CNBC program. What is it? Hello, friends. The NASDAQ is up. He was Would you like to shipper. be my neighbor? See, this is how you exposed yourself that you've never seen an episode of Mr. Rogers. He was never that chipper and up. Well, you know, with the general flow of the thing, though, the, the, the content. The general flow of Mr. Rogers. Hello, friends. Would you like to be my neighbor? Would you Have you ever seen a gladiator movie? <laughs> that type of thing. That type of uh, thing. Was well, he ever investigated? He's no. apparently the only one, the only one that was, well, maybe him and Bob Keeshan, Captain Kangaroo, they were the only ones that were pure of heart and said their prayers by night. All the others were, were somehow down deep. They were dark individuals, right? What, what about it? Bob Ross, though? Did anybody ever find out anything about him in a men's urinal at a truck stop or anything or did he just paint happy clouds no he was like a military guy and then when he got out he started painting and then he got a perm and then he started doing local access tv and then it went on pbs nationwide and what a great relaxing show they should just air that all the time well, 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 well now wait you, you glossed over the lead there skippy he was in the military what was he some kind of SEAL Team 6 or Sniper or something, like had 972 confirmed kills and to therapeutic, therapeutically therapeutize himself. Yeah. He uh, he took up painting and, and found a talent for it, or was he just like a... He was sitting at a desk in the Pentagon somewhere. I don't know. I mean, he couldn't have been a drill sergeant, right, with that relaxing voice and... Well, maybe he was a different... Maybe All he right. was Frank Sutton when he was in the military, and that's why he went the other way. He had to calm himself down. I want you to give me 10 happy little push-ups. See, that wouldn't work, it doesn't seem doesn't like. Doesn't work. Were... No. But I'm saying he probably didn't... Do... He was probably completely over the top of the other direction. He was probably at fucking... What was that guy's name? Ed... Edward Wayne Gacy Army or something? The the. Who? the... The guy that plays all the military shit, and they get him on the gun channel for other... And he, hey, he's a drill sergeant type. Oh, from Full Metal Jacket? Army, or Ermy, Army, Ermy Army. From Full Metal Army Jacket? Hammer, Ar Arlie Ermy. What's his name? Have you seen Full Metal Jacket? I didn't, I not, I don't remember. You don't remember? It's one of the classic films. It's a Kubrick film. Well, that's probably why I didn't see it, because he made that fucking piece of shit 2001 A Space Odyssey. Worst movie ever fucking made. Did you like The Shining? Well, The Shining's okay, but that's because of Nicholson. But it came I out mean, after 2001, so you gave him a second chance as a filmmaker. Well, I didn't know he was behind it. Now I'm going to have to reevaluate my <laughs> stance. <laughs> Come on, that's ridiculous. But anyway, what was I asking you? You were oh, asking me about Full maybe, Metal Jacket. No, I said maybe Bob Ross was a goddamn real prick. And then because of whatever happened in the military, he he retired to... A cottage in Cape Cod and began painting happy little clouds and bushy little trees. See, there could have been said, did you ever read his autobiography? Did he write an autobiography? I don't know. Did you ever read it? I didn't read it. I don't think he wrote it. Well, if, if he didn't write it, there's no way you could have read it. But if he did write it, somebody send Great Brian Last a copy so we can get this cleared up. But this, are this, you, so we can get this big issue cleared up. Yes, so that's right. Yes. yes. What were we talking about to begin with? Oh, the a TV host, uh, Mr. Rogers and the like, you have to admit something out here in public. You've confided in me before we went on the air that you have been in the past mistaken about a, a certain comment no. that you made here real recently when I said... Hip, hip, hooray, John Stewart is back on a daily show on Monday nights on the Comedy Central Network channel thing. And and I said, this is great news. He's the funniest man on television. And from you, I got really, really, hooray. And you were not impressed with the level of John Stewart's genius in the comedic arts. 
And but now you watched it Monday night, and you well, he was funny. Is what you said. Well, he was funny. Yeah, it was really good. I enjoyed it. So that means you're admitting you were completely wrong. That's not what I'm saying. And if I ever made a mistake like that, it would be edited right out of the Observer, so you don't have to worry about it. All right, hey. What I'm saying is, to say someone is the funniest man on television is a big, big thing to put on their shoulders. I don't know if well, I'm prepared to make that comment yet. He he he's got the big wide shoulders. He can carry it. If 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 John Stewart tells you that a chicken can pull a box car or hook him up. I've never heard you go so gaga over someone like this before. <laughs> well, John and I go way back. But no, he just I just I love his uh I love his incisive and biting sarcasm and et cetera, et cetera. But name somebody else funnier on television right now. Uh, I, I, off the top of my head, I, I don't know. Kramer? What? No, I'm kidding. I, I don't know. Uh, who? Yeah. I, I mean, there aren't too many people funny on TV See, anymore. See, that's why you're out of touch, it. Brian Last. That's what, not only is there not a lot of funny <laughs> people, but you wouldn't know if they were. You're out of touch. With the kids and the pop culture and the trends and the oh get out of here and the fashions, you're an out of touch old man because all you do is work. You don't know how to turn and, on and, a smartphone. And you would no see. I'm with the kids. I'm with the <laughs> hey, who's hosting <laughs> the Daily Show on? Someone Comedy investigate Central. that. My favorite guy. See, I'm I'm out there amongst the children regularly, talking to them, getting picking up on the on the trends and what's trendy. So that I can continue to trend. And how did John's reappearance do in the key demo? Oh, the, the kids from 8 to 12, they fucking love him. <laughs> First of all, that's not a demo, and that's not a demo watching Comedy well, Central, I'm, let alone see, the I'm, Daily I'm Show at 11 young. p.m. I'm, I'm getting them young because then I will always be ahead of the curve and ahead of the trends, and I'll always be fresh and exciting and minty fresh even because I'm going to do nothing but surround myself with children from the age of eight to twelve that I can absorb and 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 I can reach out and, and grab their knowledge and 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 then I will be young at heart and I'll be ahead of all of these people and nobody can call me out of touch. I'm gonna I'm gonna have my finger right on those kids' pulses. I can't believe what, as you were you, I, I, I can't believe as right you were talking both sides of the neck. Right? I can't believe as you were saying all this, you kept thinking, this is a good idea. I'm gonna keep going. Well, no, I'm I'm just telling you. I'm going to stay up with all the new trends. I'm watching a TV show on Netflix. I mentioned this to you before that we went on the air, and you had not heard of it. I'm not actually watching the Netflix, Stace is. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm there to observe as she, however she gets the Netflix on her new smart television in the art studio. And... I am watching The Watcher. Are you talking to me? No. Have I lost you? I'm oh. certainly not talking to you. What do you, uh, I don't know what The Watcher is. Who's watching what other than you watching The Watcher? The Watcher is a TV series on Netflix that is of the, it's by Ryan Murphy who does the American Horror Story stuff or has done. And uh, all that type of thing. I don't know what else he's done, but I guess he's very prolific. And it's another one of these, it's uh, seven episodes, and I assume it's going to have a conclusion. It better have a goddamn conclusion at the end, because I'm four in. I've seen four. There's three more to go. <laughs> if I have to wait like a year to find out any more details, I'm going to be highly fucking pissed. But if this thing's going to resolve itself, then we're good. It's a one of the... Uh, family moves into the house that come to find out there are strange and mysterious things at work in the neighborhood and in the house and in the history of the house and spooky shit happens from there type of show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, check that out. We wish we were Amity on uh, or Amityville, I should say. No, no, Netflix. no, it's not. No, it's not like there's not goddamn... The house is not uh, fucking infested with flies or whatever, and it's not, it's, it's spookier. And plus, they got seven episodes. But like I said, I don't know if this is intended to be an ongoing thing or if it's going to be resolved, but they've got me so far with what's going on. Is it an American show? 
Yes. Okay, yes, seven, ep- uh, seven episodes is what made me suspicious of that. The guy, uh, what's his name? I can't, I don't know the guy's name, but he was in Boardwalk Empire. He was one of the actors that was in that. They had a big cast. Was it the star of Boardwalk Empire? No, no, no. It was, he, was, he, was, uh, he was a flunky fellow. But anyway, if anybody wants to watch The Watcher, just don't tell me over the next few days what happens. Unless if we don't get to a goddamn finish at the end of this thing, I'm going to be highly pissed off because I'm not. And then if they don't pick it up for renewal, will we ever find out who was behind what was going on? Because that happens sometimes, too. Did we ever find out why that town suddenly had a dome over it? That was impenetrable. What was the name of that show? Under the Dome. What show was that? Did we ever that? find out I've who never was even behind heard of that the dome? Show. That was several years ago <laughs> on, on one of the networks, and I started uh, suddenly just this small town had an invisible but impenetrable dome appear over the top of it. And it stars Pauly Shore and Andy Dick. Well, no, I think it was uh, Dick Shore and uh, Paulie Dangerously were the stars of this one. They couldn't get their first choices. And they were trying to tunnel, and I don't know what the fuck. And then I think I got busy and was traveling, and I didn't see the last few episodes, but then it, it didn't come back. And I don't know that we ever found out if they got out of the dome or if anybody else got in the dome or where the dome came from. It was a dumb dome. Yeah, all right. Well, okay. Uh, sounds uh that was the TV review from Jim yeah, Cornette. I went to the eye doctor. For real nothing, this time? No, yes, and nothing bad happened. And believe it or not, 15 years I haven't had a new pair of glasses or been to the eye doctor. And they said, Well, your your prescription for seeing far away has changed surprisingly little. And up close was a little bit different. They didn't have to put drops in my eyes because then now we have a machine now that can scan your eye with light instead of the drops. I, but it's $25 extra. I said, it, lady, if you'd have had a guy in a parking lot out behind a tree saying, give me a hundred bucks cash and I'll make sure they don't put drops in your eyes, I would have taken his deal. So they didn't have to put drops in my eyes. I, I've got no glaucoma. I don't have... Whatever that illness is you get in your eyes that they have the TV commercials for where your eyes bug out like Marty Feldman and Young Frankenstein. So uh, overall, they didn't tell me that. See, I'm always afraid that there uh, some learned professional is going to examine some feature of mine and say, oh, my God, get to a hospital. But they were not that nobody vomited. Nobody threw up, got physically, violently ill when they looked at me or looked at my results. So I think I'm okay. All right. So we have uh, we have that to go for, or that good news. This show's really moving along at a brisk pace today, aren't we? All right. Well. I thought you'd have something funny to say about the eye doctor. You know, it was just, <laughs> I went to the doctor and everything's me. great. It's been hilarious to me. Hey, what did you want? Some goddamn prognosis in the, in the negative direction. I'm trying to be positive. Like Kostra positive. I'm going to be positive. And you're wanting to, Oh my God, you'll go blind in the next six weeks or I think it would help the show. Well, I'm, I'm. Then you go blind. You I don't think that would help the I'll show. Talk about it. I don't think that would help the show. If you went blind, it would help the show. If I went blind, it would destroy the show. But no. How about this? How about you get up one morning and suddenly your dick has fallen off? Oh no! And you tell me about, it, and then I'd get to talk about it and try to talk you through a possible diagnosis. Now there's a That's situation. Good radio. Where- that's good right where we could so you let me know when it's time for me to start talking about that however if jim Cornette lost his vision but he still had his mouth he could still talk we can have a great time with you venting about the world from behind the uh how the fuck am i gonna vent eyes. about it i can't see it and from behind the what i don't know where the mic if you went is. blind you think the complaining would stop 
What do you think? I'm, I'll, I'll be sitting here fucking talking into the window. You won't be able to hear me because I can't find the microphone. Well, Stacy or someone will come and put you in front of the chair and or in the oh, chair. Oh, well, yeah, and that'd be a risk. You know what? She would put me. <laughs> she would put me in like some fucking position. Get a big giant horse, stuffed horse's ass, and sit me right in front of it, and lift the tail up, and take a picture and tweet it. That's what she'd do. You see, everyone benefits. <clears throat> but speaking of benefit, even if you went blind, you'd be able to play with your action figure. Oh, I guess it's time for that. You know, I'll tell you another thing. We uh, we said uh, we sent our best wishes to Hotchkiss Featherbottom's mother who had pneumonia. She was feeling puny last week, but she is doing better now and on all the appropriate medications and getting things checked out. And so Hotchkiss has turned his attention fully to the fulfillment of the fulfilling figures that the fans have purchased at jimcornett.com of the Midnight Express, Eaton and Condry, Midnight Express, Eaton and Lane, and the Heavenly Bodies Lane and Dr. Tom Pritchard, right along there at ringside as well. And I'm proud to say that we will be shipping out the first uh, 250 or, or so, possibly a little bit more, orders to the awaiting consumers on the week of February 26th, which is this coming Monday. We are, boom, and we're we're still... We got the assembly line going now, baby. It'll probably be the same thing or thereabouts the following week. And we expect to have everybody's uh, orders to them in the next two to three weeks. And then the other Jim Cornette merchandise will come back on sale. In the meantime, if you have not ordered, then your weight has been reduced to a mere pittance, a mere bag of shells of time. Before you can have these limited edition only available at jimcornette.com, nowhere else in the world, Tag team action figure sets with personalized autograph photos and more. And you can go to jimcornet.com and click on each of these items at no charge just to find out what you get when you order them. And, uh, and but any, I'm proud of the, the feather bottoms they have pulled together on this one. And we are, we are kicking ass behind the scenes. As I said, the first 250 orders are about ready to go out. Of all the items you've sold over the many years you've had Cornette's collectibles, what was the toughest item to either package or master the packaging of? Um, what I had to give up on was an old-time fan. He came to a couple of the uh, Smoky Mountain Fan Weeks, Justin Crockett from oh, yeah. Kansas. Yeah. yeah, good guy. He works at a company that makes a variety of uh, souvenir-type items and things like that, and he, I got the... Cornet face, cult of cornet, pint, beer glasses, and coffee mugs. And they were beautiful pieces of work. And they and the, they were quite popular. But god damn it, between the pint glasses weren't so bad, but the coffee mugs, I got special boxes. And I had them wrapped in bubble wrap and then peanutted around the edges. And they were crush proof boxes. And I swear to God, I mailed out as many replacements as I did actually sell the item because every time somebody would open the box, the fucking handle of the mug would be broken off. Yeah, that's the problem with glassware. That's the biggest pain and, about it. Yes, yeah, so that's in, and then it, it was awkward uh, box shapes that didn't fit any of the other merchandise, and that's why I did not uh, keep that up. That was awkward with the packaging and the delivering. A fine item, though, that I still drink out of sometimes to this day in my own home here at the castle. All right. Well, you can get other items at, well, you can't get them right now. You can get certain items at jimcornet.com. You can, you can get enough items right now at jimcornet.com. And uh, use the promo code I, JCE. Hey, yes. And let's see what that gets you. And as I mentioned, <laughs> the heavenly bodies are outpacing the Midnight Express combinations because this is the first and only time for the bodies figures. And, and also, uh, we've got a limited number of those, but uh, uh, you still have time to get in on the bodies. But as they go, they, they will probably be the first to sell out. So that's just the warning on that. Did you design or I forget the story. Did you make suggestions to the seamstress, whoever made the heavenly bodies trunks with the, whatever, the comet, the rockets, the stars? Yes. The, yes. <laughs> um, well, we wanted, <laughs> that's when we were talking about costuming. Uh, a couple of shows ago and how it was different the territory days versus now, et cetera. 
I mentioned that we uh, we'd gotten from Sting the name of the lady that made some of his stuff, and she was out of Dallas. Uh, Susie Tennis, I believe, was her name. And so I had time and, you know, wanted to put something into the body's debut because is the, you know, the first heel team and uh, top heel team and first champions in Smoky Mountain. So obviously I didn't sit there and draw it like goddamn, you know, I'm trying to name a goddamn designer and that's how far out I am from designers. But uh, <laughs> Calvin Klein, whatever. But I said, yeah, Coco we, we, Chanel, Coco Chanel. See, I said, we want Coco Chanel like robes. No, <laughs> I, I actually more like Coco wear, but, uh, I, we, robes. And we want the, the signs of the heavenly bodies, a Saturn with rings or a moon shape or a comet blazing or whatever. And then she sent kind of little drawings. It was, yeah, do it. And, uh, the only the only change we made when we got Stan's robe because he had, was tall and had that you know that shape where he looked good in a robe, and Bobby, as Arn Anderson used to say, was always was all trunk. He had short legs and he, a longer upper body, so usually he'd wear a jacket, right, most of the time. So we said, and Tom, you know, to be different but still match, we just said, well, why don't we have Stan with a robe and Dr. Tom can have the jacket and maybe the pants because that would be cool, right? The full outfit, which looked great because the pants with the fucking gold sequins around the edges and the, you know, uh, heavily celestial body fucking things on them. And there was zippers. They were big... Um, big uh, cuffs and there's still a little zipper down to bottom, but still it was Tom couldn't take them off. He would get stuck over trying to get them over your boots. Imagine trying to take your blue jeans off over your work boots, whatever. So after the first, I think a couple of tapings, we retired the pants. I have them hanging in the office here right now. To Dr. Tom's pants. They've not been worn in 30 years. Uh, but that's how, you know, the, and she made them and sent them up. And then, to be perfectly honest, because we were on a budget, when Stan decided to retire, you know, from wrestling, and he that's right before he went up and did the year with commentary up in the WWF, he turned the robe back in, and we took the S off the breastplate of it and had a J put on for Jimmy Del Rey, and he was only like two inches shorter than Stan, so he fucking hiked his shoulders up, and we made the fucking same robe work. All right, well, you can get those figures today. Once again, jimcornet.com. They're, they're wearing the, the, these uh, uh, outfits that I'm speaking of in the actual figure sets, and we have autographed the picture of them wearing the outfits with the Smoky Mountain Tag Team title belts, but you can't get the actual robe. But if somebody's willing to make a real good offer on my pants on behalf of Dr. Tom Pritchard, or my pants, Make me an offer of Dr. Tom's pants on behalf of Dr. Tom. Uh, if somebody wants to pay a significant amount for his heavenly body pants, I would accept that for him and forward him the, uh, the cash. So send those emails to corny drive through at what gmail.com. He should sign things now. Like Dr. Tom Pritchard looking for my pants since 1994. <laughs> Pantsless since 93. <laughs> <laughs> all right well jim but yeah hey they're one of a kind they are one it's, of a kind you know, they're one of a kind and nowhere else in this world exists dr tom's pants that have not been worn in 30 years you can yeah, i'm sure his dna's i never had him washed so his dna's probably in there somewhere all right well if you've been looking to do an odd paternity test this may be a great way <laughs> to get tom's dna and find out what's going on All right, well, the, si right. the silence there uh, <laughs> speaks volumes. But no, we uh, let's get away from uh, paternity and let's get to uh, patriarchy, or I don't know what we want to call it. We have other topics, but let's talk about whatever you watched on Raw this week. I watched oh. it, I think. I can't remember too much about it. I remember the end of the main event. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about whatever you saw on Raw. 
I watched it. I think I can't remember. Actually, those are all words and phrases I was going to use. This, I mean, it, 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 right now they're, they're coasting. Um, this it w was neither a, you know, fast breaking race car to the top or a plummeting, you know, a uh, uh, snow sled to the bottom. This was just kind of, we're just chugging right along. Nothing's going to happen here tonight that's really important. And a lot of people aren't even here, but we're going to fill this three hours. And if Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre hadn't come to work that day, this show would have been pretty much a complete loss. So we will spend most of the time, of the brief time that we're going to talk about, this was for... February 19th, Anaheim, California. There were 13,264 people in the building, according to them. And this is the show that they... How the fuck do they keep selling these live event tickets? I can understand why the people are watching TV, because the stars talking to you is what everybody's watching for, but goddamn, goddamn, if I don't even know in in late in my later years here that I want to goddamn spend money, leave my house, fight traffic, park, sit in the middle of a crowd to hear the fucking eagles sing at me, much less people talk to me. How do they sell in these tickets, Brian? It's the hot thing right now. It's amazing when it's a show like this. There's no Roman Reigns, no Rock, no obviously no CM Punk. Cody's a big star, but no Rollins. Doesn't really seem to matter. And the other thing is, even, even when it's a match, typically the women's matches everywhere have quiet audience for a variety of reasons. But they're watching. Like, WWE fans are sitting there. I feel like they've almost been trained now, finally. Like, if you're going to a Raw, you're going to be a part of that show and see it happen. So they are more willing to accept a lot of things. You get a little bit of action. You may get to see some of the stars, endless entrances. And because the talent is so hot right now, everything's hot. They can go anywhere right now and draw a big crowd. Meanwhile, uh, yeah. meanwhile, I mean, I just saw what AEW, I forget what town it was. It was like a comparison between them. It may have, it may have been Tulsa, because they just debuted in Tulsa for Dynamite. And it was like the last few crowds of WWE there versus their debut. It's not an industry-wide thing. It's a WWE thing. They're hot. Yeah, well, and it, yeah, a rising tide does lift all boats in most instances, but to get AEW hot at this point, you would literally have to be able to set fire to an ice cube, wouldn't you? I mean, there's some things that just can't be done. But nevertheless, we'll slander them at another time. Uh, they opened up with Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre, and I'm glad they did because I had the most patience at this point at the start of the program, and this was the best thing on it. <sighs> and it still I, went too long, and it was kind of dry at times. Well, that's what I was about to say is it was the best thing on it because it was professionally done. You got two guys that are over. Drew's doing a great job. Cody knows how to put these matches together. I'm getting a little thunder here. If your super hearing starts to goddamn tangle. Um, I don't hear anything. It's all you. Oh, God. Cody knows how to put these things together to keep them interesting. He sells like Ricky Morton, right? You know, he with the expression on his face and the dazed look in his eye. And he's got fire on his comebacks or when he fights from underneath. I'm not maligning either of these gentlemen's work or performance in this. It, it was broken up twice by breaks, which, you know, disrupts the flow. And then it, they also, they told him, well, you gotta, you guys got to do the first half hour. Because that it was a half the first half hour of the show. It was thirty minutes in by the time they got out of the fucking announcers saying, "Boy, what a match!" So it was it was rough at points, 
but uh, but of what they do when they do this with other. The point is, Cody and Drew did what a lot of other people can't do as interestingly or keep keep you with it. They did it. This was the highlight of the show, even if they had to go so fucking long and be broken up. And it's a cold match in terms of the overall scheme of things because the Elimination Chamber's coming up. So, And that's where they went with it, is basically after a number of nice false finishes, suddenly Cody, who you would think is going to win, gets a two count with a cutter, and then Uso runs out. He's up on the apron. Cody nails him, goes for the crossroads on Drew, and is the referee still trying to deal with Uso, Solo in the black hood and hoodie and disguise comes to the other apron and from behind spikes Cody, boom, and he sells it like a million dollars. And then McIntyre hits him with the Claymore, one, two, three. So not only did Cody do the first job since, I don't know when the last time he did a job, maybe to Roman, but it's for Drew, and it was perfect because the bloodline not only cost Cody coming up on Mania, but Drew, whether he, we will come to find out he knew it or didn't know it or claims he didn't know it or whatever, he accepted a win, a, a, an assist on the win from the bloodline, his supposed enemy, so he's a hypocrite in, in his heel metamorphosis. The timing that everybody did with this was right. It was the right finish. It helped everybody. It wasn't a meaningless job like you would sometimes see in other situations. Everybody prospered from this, and it didn't hurt Cody a bit. And I'm just, uh, uh, when this was over with, I also thought Tony Khan lost Cody and kept Moxley. Good Lord. But besides being a little long and a little dry in spots, your thoughts? He kind of summed them up. I don't, again, I don't think it was a option between Moxley and Cody, but he probably would have chose. Uh, well, I'm, I'm one just, I'm just saying, with. you know, it, it, <laughs> this guy is the one that got away and the other guys featured every week. This was a long match. It wasn't exactly exciting the whole time, but you had a big star in there and you had someone who's becoming interesting. This is an example of what I was talking about before. The WWE fans, they don't chant boring, and they don't look bored. No. Well, as a matter of fact, the let's go Cody was the chant on their lockup here with him and Drew. And there was a this is awesome chant after a, when Drew took over and hit him with a power bomb where he just muscled him right up and hit him with it. The They have... <laughs> I hate to say it, lowered expectations for you mad TV fans out there. They have lowered the expectations, I think, of a lot of the, in, I won't say average fans, because are the average fans the people that buy the tickets? Of, of, of They're dedicated fans. They're just happy to see those guys, as you said, live in person, whether they're speaking or having a fairly safe, professionally done, excitingly put together match, but nobody's going to get fucking killed and there's going to be no uh, outrageous storyline happening in the middle of something where you kind of know there ain't going to be something happening yeah yeah good finish though getting the bloodline involved putting over the spike good finish but then to fill out the first hour of the program i swear I'm, and, and more, actually. They went past the top of the 9 o'clock hour. After a couple of little spots and pitches and a backstage hoo-ha, a women's battle royal that was finally won by Raquel Rodriguez Gonzalez de Molina Jr. And that was, they were already like five minutes past the top of the hour for the finish of the women's battle royal. So Cody and Drew and women's battle royal, that was it for an hour and five minutes. So this was the ultimate stretch. Get every everything you can get out of everything. Cause they it just uh it was like a coasting show, a maintenance show, as Kevin Sullivan used to call it. I mean, there's a 
there's a stipulation or a an impact on the elimination chamber on this match or that match or she's going to get, but no, it's just we're filling fucking time here. How many? How many forever. people? How many people do you think watched that segment? Oh, probably. Uh, well, this is raw and uh, football's over, right? Probably what 1.6, 1.7 million. The battle royal was in two different quarters: 1.98 million and 1.95 oh. million. Oh God! What was the overall number then? Uh, hold the on. I got that over here. Overall number was 1.87 million. Good night. So obviously the third hour drug them down again, but, um, yeah. yeah, so they got 2 million people watching a women's battle royal for a half a fucking hour. There is nothing going on on this program, but the people are watching it. And they picked up a hundred thousand people for the main event. <laughs> Because the last three quarters are 10.15 to 10.30 are 1.76, 10.30 to 10.45, 1.68, and then 10.45 to 11, 1.79. Jeez. That'd, that'd, uh, that'd make Tony a good Friday night program, wouldn't it? Just their fluctuation from quarter to quarter. Did you see the SmackDown numbers? Oh, I think two point uh, six million or seven million or something of that nature. Listen to the last three quarters, just because we did, just did it for Raw here. Last three quarters: nine fifteen to nine thirty, two point three nine million. Nine thirty to nine forty five, two point five eight million. Nine forty five to ten p.m., two point eight nine million. Jesus Christ! That was for the Rock's promo with the Bloodline. Oh. So uh, the rock literally from the, from the quarter previous to the whole bloodline thing, the rock picked that thing up almost a Wednesday night rating for Tony Khan. All righty, but back to reality <laughs> on raw where a measly 1.8, 1.9 million people were watching. Then they, after the women's battle Royal won by Raquel, they had the sit-down split screen with Rhea Ripley in a refrigerator, and then they had a long hey, package. Well, what, what? What do you think of that? The, I, was, I didn't watch it. No, you know, I've always liked the split screen thing ever since the ones they did in World Class with uh, Fritz and Ric Flair. And then for a while, they had the face-to-face -face promos on local TV in, in like, 94. Yes. What, what do you think of using split screen? Well, I like the the concept of it if it's, you know, people that I care about. Or in this case, I, you know, care deeply for Rhea Ripley. We got a thing going on. No, you don't. Don't, don't, don't. You know that I'm wrong. Yes, I do. I'm much too strong. All right, um... I, but I can't stand the refrigerator. She leaves me cold. So I skipped over this. But as a general rule, the split screen, yes. Remember that Watts County used to do the same thing on local promos when the baby faces would be at the desk and then the they would switch to comments directly from the heels about what the baby faces had said or vice versa, but the baby faces were in the at the desk and the heels were in another studio and actually if you could you did that didn't you where you could react to what yes. you're hearing yeah yes but if you could see where we were in 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 the studio at tbs <laughs> there was like 10 feet difference and it was absolutely open so we could hear each other anyway it was just like but but it works because you've got volatile personalities that are interacting with each other at a live time or whatever you know, the idea of the split screen, there's two volatile personalities that, you know, have an issue and they can't be in the same place at the same time, but they can react to each other either in real time or one listens and then responds back and then you go back and forth. What I love that. If it's the right people doing it and they can pull it off, everything's, you know, great. But there's nothing wrong with the concept. There's just something wrong with the refrigerator. Is it tough to do that, though, the reaction shot? You know, you're standing there, you're being filmed, but you're not in the same room, but you have to react to it. No. No, and they're just trying to get the right reaction because you can't really have any action or anything. No, I guess not. Well, no, I mean, you know, 
you're either you're either listening to what's being said or potentially in some cases if they've got a budget you can watch a monitor and see them at the same time um i never had any trouble but then again i'm god and the magnitude <laughs> of me you know is such that i would be able to pull it off no matter what the fucking potential ramifications well maybe uh nia jackson well i'll just say it, but i'm sure you would have liked rhea ripley here but uh you didn't see yeah yeah i'd have, I'd have been half happy and then as they had the, the long involved thing with about our truth and his judgment day and i'm skipping through this too because it's all shit we've seen anyway and then the it's UFC, over it's it, it well it's hopefully hopefully uh, I haven't understood it to begin with, and then, well, the Judgment Day is about to be in a goddamn eight-man tag team match with mid-card guys. It looks like AEW booking, but did you enjoy seeing the UFC's Michael Chandler? Boy, give that guy uh, a mic every week. <laughs> cutting a promo there at rings. And so <laughs> everybody thought that I was out of my fucking mind when I've said that the UFC has been doing pro wrestling better than pro wrestling has been doing it in, in modern times as far as hyping fights and getting stars over and everything. Now, if they're going to let the UFC guys start cutting a few promos, we might be able to meet in the middle from so dry. You've got to watch it in the rain to so fucking phony. It's a football bat. You know, not everyone could talk, but this guy was spectacular. This would be an interesting way to promote or cross promote. It's the same company, UFC events. Just every now and then on Raw before an event, have one of these guys out there to do a promo before the live crowd. Yeah. Or just even if one of these guys happens to be visiting one of his friends on the roster in the WWE, and now they see him in the back and the guy cuts the promo there. It doesn't have to be, oh, come up from your ringside seat and cut a promo, you know, they can work it into the programming because the, the same company owns both. And I, t I talked about it, I think, on the air. Certainly we did. It had to be on the air. You and I always record, even when we're discussing the weather. CM Punk, as he makes a transition at whatever point from the ring to behind a microphone or in some other capacity in the business, He's uniquely suited. There have been other, you know, guys that have fought in both the UFC and competed in the WWE, but they also can't talk and aren't experienced color guys, potentially. He's done everything, and he's done uh, commentary on MMA. So that's going to be a great crawl. And he's a, a star, a name. They've got tons of opportunities now to bring let's say the UFC fucking guy, he's got a promising future, but he blows his knee and whatever. He can't handle somebody jumping up and down on his leg for real twice a year, but goddamn, if somebody's going to try to help protect him, same thing, it could, could UFC be the new football like it was in the 60s and 70s? So that's... Although there's I so like many it. opportunities to get some grown men back into business. I did like, though, the fact that he was just there, ringside, he gets the applause, they give him the mic, and then he just starts going while standing in the crowd. It was a different look. It didn't feel like a setup kind of thing that you would see on Raw. And because of that, oh, I yeah, it was effective. Yeah. Well, I know, but that's what I'm saying is that now if they started doing that all the time, then it would get, you know, there's different ways they can have them do anything they want because it's not like if you're a UFC fighter, you're violating your contract by appearing on wwe programming oh. anymore it, it's yeah now you have someone to ask for tickets yeah <laughs> so that's so again tony's got the pipeline from you know mexico for interchangeable mask guys that nobody's ever heard of and small children from cucamonga that trained in their backyard on a trampoline and the wwe will actually be able to draw from a pool of some of the most well-known professional athletes in the business or in, in the business in the country today. Very interesting. You know what wasn't interesting? Monday Night Raw. Where we had an eight-man tag team contest with Priest and Finn and J.D. Funko and Dominic. 
against R Truth and The Miz and Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Same Face. And yeah, I know that eventually Priest choke slam Truth one two three, but God Almighty, um, I'm just, I'm I I don't want any more R Truth and Judgment Day. And why are they suddenly you know fucking with the mid card people? Well, not suddenly, it's been ongoing. But weren't they supposed to be a big major faction and movement in this industry? Uh. You know, the Judgment Day were the top heel faction when things really started heating up. The Rhea Dominic thing was so hot. It feels like so long ago now. Those two aren't even seen together anymore. And Dominic still gets the booze, but not having Rhea there, I think, has kind of hurt him. And Priest, you know, this was kind of the year you thought maybe he'd be elevated. He's just where he was. Yeah. The comedy stuff's over. And I'll say this, because there's been so many guys to do the comedy stuff in the ring for WWE, like that style. And there's ones I don't like. Like, I'm not a Santino Morella fan. It's too goofy for me, you know? R-Truth pulls it off better than maybe anyone ever. You almost believe he is this character. He's very sincere with it. Yeah, he's believable as this wacky wrestling character. But again, are the Judgment Day a top heel faction? Or are they just a mid-card faction? Because they used to be the top heel faction on the show. The show would open with them doing a promo or confronting another person doing a promo. Then we get, like, promos throughout the show. And then the main event would be a tag or a six-man featuring all those people. That's not what's happening anymore. Who knows why? Well, and I'm sure they saw that of the bunch, of the collection, Rhea Ripley is the star, has the most potential. I, I, We've liked to see, or wanted to see, Priest elevated and liked what we saw early on. He's kind of stuck there where he is now. Maybe that's where he's going to be, or maybe it's usage. But I don't think Priest is going to be the guy, whereas Rhea is going to be the the girl. So maybe they did, you know, for Rhea and Dominic, it was nice, but Dominic still got the heat for being his own guy. And, uh, you know, Rhea's still in the group, but she's got her own shit going on because they want to cheer the fuck out of her every time she's not with Judgment Day and most of the time when she is with them. So I can see why they separated her because there's the most money in her individually. Should they do something, though, whether it's, you know, just spitballing here. Dominic has a new girlfriend. Or there's a new girl aligned with Judgment Day. Just something, because if you're going to break her apart from them, there's no one for her to wrestle. There's no one for her to do anything with. So you'd almost have to replace, have someone for her to feud with to end her Judgment Day thing, unless she just well, no. lingers on. and Well, well no. It, it, it There doesn't need to be... I think eventually... Unless it's Rhea versus Dominic. What their... Probably their goal may be is to, by the time that Rhea uh, is... is there, By the time they want Rhea to be completely away from the Judgment Day, she will be a full-fledged babyface because of what has happened in her world with the other women that didn't have anything to do with the Judgment Day guys or any other guys, and then they will tie up some loose end with Dominic. I don't think they'll even need to address it with Priest or Finn or JD because the only real issue there is with Dominic, and, you know, he might stab her in the back in favor of her, the girl that she's in some issue with at that point to begin with, or not to join that, girl but just to make his feelings known about which side he's on get some heat and then he's out of it you you can you can work that out later on well like we said you you're not big on it it's a lot of comedy stuff but it held those fans i mean the fans there were into it oh i know they were reacting they're strapped down like they're sitting in old sparky come on they can't get up uh, and then we got to watch a, a package of the three million 
uh, people drawing segment from SmackDown of the Rock and the Bloodline. And that's where the people that came to watch Raw are now watching goddamn the screen for they're watching television in the arena. And then we were two hours into the program with what we've just talked about, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, the little spots and the little bells and whistles and tickles and things and a few backstage uh, soliloquies, but that was the meat of the matter to what people have, have seen in the building so far. And then here comes Becky Lynch at 5 minutes to 10 Eastern. And she's going to do an in-ring promo where she talks about winning the Elimination Chamber and then fighting Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania and does big promo on Rhea. And Becky Lynch, she can talk and she's got a wonderful vocabulary. And she used a lot of words here. And this went on for quite a while. And I mean, yes, again, people are interested, maybe not as interested in everything she had to say as they might have been an hour or an hour and a half earlier, though, by this point in the night. But then, after she talked for a while, then here came Liv Morgan. And then now we see what's going to happen. Everybody in the Elimination Chamber. And they're all going to come out with a microphone and start reciting their scripted verbiage. Liv Morgan, then Raquel, then Naomi, then Tiffany, then Bianca. And I wrote, this will not end. And I summarized it with half a dozen bad actresses dressed in ball gowns and sequins exchanging fake scripted verbiage with no real emotion on a wrestling program. And then they got in a fight. As soon as that happened, the refrigerator came out and beat up all of them. Leg dropped all of them, left them all laying there flatter than a plate full of piss. 15 minutes from start to finish of this. You know, the average goddamn half-hour television program of modern times is 22 minutes plus commercials. This was almost an entire episode of Seinfeld. We've seen so many good talking segments lately. This is a good reminder of what WWE has been for 20 plus years. But just one person comes out, then another music hits. Then another, then another. Same thing before we battle Royal, Royal Rumble, Elimination Chamber, Survivor Series. It was, uh, eh, not very good. Woo! Went on for a while. I want to see Meryl Streep come out there and really dig deep and give us some goddamn, give us some emoting. Anyway, speaking of emoting, is that another word for regurgitating? Because that's what I almost no. did. It was Gable versus Ivar. And I know on fast forward, Gable is an amazing athlete. And I'm sure there was some good shit involved in this, but there's only so much time in the day. And, you know, we've seen these guys for the past couple of years. So that means that we don't, because of the way they've been presented, even if they're changing their trajectory, we don't want to see too much more of them. Hey, Gable makes me think of Model Girl. Did you see that video going around a Model Girl taking the bonsai drop from that? Yes. Rex? Yes. <laughs> Where she forgot to <laughs> register. It, 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 Do anything. Yeah. <laughs> for, for, for those of you who may not have seen this, it was on Twitter. I guess it's a fan cam from, was that a house show or? Yeah, I think so. It better have been. I'm sure it aired <laughs> on television. But she's laying there and the refrigerator, Jax, is going to give her the big bonsai drop off the turnbuckle. And model girl is laying there with her arms flat at her side. She looks like she's laid out in a coffin and she's completely immobile. And you can tell she's probably scared shitless because she don't get the, we've seen her in the ring. She don't get it. She's never going to get it. She's confused. Poor thing. Somebody's filled her head full of nonsense that she should be doing this. So she's laying there flat as a board, stiff as a plank, completely immobile. And Nia Jax jumps up and drops all of her in the bonsai drop, all of her weight on top of the young lady. 
and, but not in a, a stiff way like people would expect or not in a intentionally reckless way, but like to do the move and the girl doesn't move. She doesn't flinch. She doesn't react. And so it looked faker than anything I've ever seen because here's 400 pounds coming down, flying through the air and boom, lands on this hundred pound blonde girl and it doesn't move a fucking hair on her head. <laughs> she was so scared that she probably had her eyes closed and was just thinking, oh my God, my life has come to an end. And she didn't know when it happened. Now, th that kind of thing, if I was model girl, I wouldn't take bonsai number two. Because now that that's gone around, if this was the old days, and that had gone around like that, and everybody saw her no-sell, this fucking big finish that's killed everybody, the next one, she would probably be selling. Man, how are you supposed to sell the bonsai drop? What's the best way? Like, what's appropriate? What's too much? Well, you've got you. It, obviously, what would happen if this if it was real? When that weight comes down on your chest and stomach, your legs would pull up or shoot up and say, "Imagine what happens when you get a stiff blow to your stomach." Woof! It doubles you over, right? So, your head, your you can't do a sit up because there's 500 pounds on you or 600 of Yokozuna or whatever. Your legs can kick up, and once the the, the landing, you can move a little bit. Where your arms, if if they are out, can fucking twitch. And then, if the person giving it to you stands up a little bit, you can grab your grip your midsection and turn over or to start coughing, like oh, you know, and you see it on your face that oh my god. You don't just lay there completely immobile to illustrate that there was no contact whatsoever and no weight dropped on you. You move and react and register however you can. I mean, Yoko or anybody that's doing something like that, if they know that somebody is not going to make them look bad or just be a putz and they like the person, they can take care of me. As I've said with Yoko, you wouldn't feel it. But you better sell the shit, because if you don't, the next time you're going to feel it real fucking good, because then that makes that person look bullshit as well as you when you don't sell anything, and it just looks phony because of it. Maybe she was so scared she asked someone, how do I sell it? And they said, just don't move. And she took it literal and just never well, moved. Well, no, <laughs> I mean, you know, yes, don't move is often, but not after you get hit with something. Then you're supposed to move. And that's that the old rib and the fucking, you know, when you got potatoed, <laughs> you moved. No, I didn't, I didn't fucking move left. You fucking potatoed me, motherfucker. If he, you know, if you, well, that's the thing. If, if somebody's throwing something at you, punch, drop kick, you know, kick, whatever the fuck, and you move, then their responsibility level is somewhat mitigated by the fact you fucking moved. Did you flinched or you ducked or you moved or you whatever the fuck so you got you got caught because you weren't where you were supposed to be and where you were when that guy started throwing that thing that's the defense of every goddamn potato ever thrown you moved all right well the review of nia Jax versus maxine was more exciting than any other review on raw so far moving along moving along um the main event where it's time for the main event after gable and ivar the Intercontinental title match with Gunther, poor Gunther, against Jey Uso. And they ring the bell with 20 minutes left on the air and go less than a minute to the break. And then they're gone for three and a half, and they come back. And again, the main event, it's, it's Gunther. He's almost flawless. What a fucking talent. And it's also Jey Uso. And everything that we talked about last week, it's wrong with him. It's still wrong with him this week. But they, they have a professional match. They come back. They do five minutes. They go back to the break. They come back. And they do about another five. And then Jimmy or Jey Uso hits him with a splash off the top rope and covers Gunther. And the referee counts one, two, and a ding, 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 ding. The bell is ringing. And you look over, and it's the black hooded figure ringing the bell. But this time, it's Jimmy Uso. 
So the match is not over because he is not, Brian, as you may know, if, if somebody's going to ring the bell, they have to be licensed by the State Athletic Commission. It's a true fact in many commission states, at least back in the old days, nobody could touch the bell unless they were a licensed timekeeper. So I'll have you know that it, at some points to make sure that there was a licensed timekeeper on the premises, my mother was a licensed timekeeper. What? Yes. <laughs> For spot shows in Kentucky that nobody goddamn, nobody from the athletic commission was going to come to Madisonville, Kentucky, or Rabbit Ridge, or fucking Glasgow, wherever the fuck, right? So, I would be a licensed ring announcer and or timekeeper, or my mom at one point was a licensed timekeeper, and they also, you had to have, this was a $2 license, at, and then they raised it to 5 you had to have a licensed ticket taker and a licensed doorman back in those days. So I think my mom was a doorman and a timekeeper and I was a ticket taker and a fucking announcer. Like an and actual license? Like it wasn't just... Yes, I've she still got a couple of them. I got my mom's fucking timekeeper license. <laughs> but they didn't know who the fuck it was. They so you just, as long as you had a licensed person there, then they didn't know whether they were actually doing it or not. Uh, at, one show, I was the ring announcer, the timekeeper, and the fucking photographer. And, you know, it was well, not one show, but it, it, at one particular spot show I can think of. In Madisonville, I was the only one. And, and then Paul Morton was the referee, and Paul had brought the ring, and there was eight guys on the card. And my mom was the only person selling gimmicks because Donna... Uh, Teeny's niece was selling tickets and Teeny was checking up with the sponsors. There you go. We, but we had like fucking 12 <laughs> or 15 licensed fucking people in the building. I don't think I've ever heard that before, that your mom actually was licensed by the state for any of the things she was doing there. Well, that, that's the thing. She wasn't doing any of those things. You didn't have to have a license to sell gimmicks, but you had to have somebody at the show that was a licensed <laughs> So Teeny just got her a timekeeper's license. <laughs> anyway. When did that go away? You know, I, I'm going to say by the early 80s, I think they had cut it down to where referees, managers, announcers, and wrestlers was the only people that needed to be licensed by the athletic commission. I'm going to say. But you never know about these things. No. Well, uh, that was raw. Are we still no, in the middle no, of the review? We're, We're still in the middle, middle of the middle match. Of it. Yes, yes. We it's got a hell of a match. match. It's a hell of a match. What a maneuver. Jimmy Uso had rung the bell, and that was a distraction. So Jay goes over and levels a fucking uh, Gunther and then dives on Jimmy and then comes off the top on Gunther, but Gunther lifted his knees, and he splashed Gunther's knees, and he pinned him one, two, three. And then Gunther left, and Jimmy got in the ring and beat up Jay and left him laying. So those, those battling Usos, nothing settled in that blood brother rivalry. You think that's going to be WrestleMania? Because we've never had the singles match, have we? Or if I we have, they... it hasn't been a big one. Well, I think they've almost got to at WrestleMania because what else are these guys going to do at this point? So they're costing each other, you know, shots at championships and blah, blah, blah. And they have it on the big show, one whichever night. And I, I honestly don't know if in six months people are going to want to see it as much as they might want to see it right now. Well, they got a couple months until Mania. They could build it up right for that. I don't know. They don't have, they got, uh, they got six weeks. Yeah. I mean, for WrestleMania, nothing gets a build anymore, really. So I think they could do enough, but no, th they can. But if they, if they were to wait, I don't, I don't believe this is a, a thing that will, you know, just age gracefully. I think they probably ought to have that match now. Yes. Yes. That's what I say. Well, that was raw. Boy, it sure was. Yes, that was. That was raw. And uh, let's stay on the topic of WWE. Several listeners have sent in this video this morning. I guess in Australia during a media appearance or talking to media, 
Austin Theory encountered a reporter talking about wrestling being fake. Uh oh. This happened just previously, or they didn't call it fake, but Grayson Waller and a cameraman, a stagehand, whoever it was, there was almost an incident. Yeah, that, and that was in Australia as well, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. So now are they just trying to stir people up for, for clicks and likes over there? What's the matter with these Aussie news channels? Well, let's go to this clip. It's a few seconds long of Austin Theory and whoever this reporter is. What did you just say? I mean, it's fake. Like, you know, what do you mean? Like, what are you kidding each other? Hold, hold on a second. You brought me here and you're going to talk to me like this? Oh, yeah. You, hey, no, man. I mean, no, no. Just because you're in charge of some shit here, man, don't mean you can talk to me like this. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't mean to offend you. Oh, you're saying like, what I do is easy fight. and you're in front of all your people in here talking about my job's easy. You couldn't walk a damn day in my shoes. You see? Got me in here. Dude, are you kidding me, man? I'll smack the shit out of you right, right now. I'm not playing around. <laughs> Oh, bring me all the way here for some media, man. This guy's talking his head off, man. It's his problem, dude. Well, that was uh, the clip. There you go. And that's him walking out. So this is two times now we've seen, we haven't seen this in years, and two times within a month. What are your thoughts on this? Well, you've got to be an idiot at this point on, uh, to, uh, on the part of the station personnel or whether this guy was on air or production or whoever. You know what's going on, but you can't disrespect people when they're the stars that are coming in to appear on your station to get people to listen to you. They're, they're promoting, hey, we're going to have so-and-so from the WWE on, or we're going to give some tickets away, or we're going to talk about this big event that's filling up a stadium. And the first thing you can think of is to tell the guy when he walks in that what he does is fake. That no, specific even word. That specific word, though, that's like the biggest insult you can give to a wrestler, even today, yeah. right? Well, especially now, because they're really hurting themselves. Uh, it always has been for, in, 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 in previous generations up until the modern era when everybody was forcefully smartened up, if you, if you said to a wrestler, your business is fake, you, the wrestler expected he had to retaliate in some type of forceful way. Because if you got away with saying something like that with this big fucking guy, then you'd tell me, yeah, he, I said it, he didn't do anything. And the guys didn't want people to think that that was the case because that would harm their income. That would hurt their career. That would, you know, prevent them from fucking making a living and providing for their family if that kind of shit got widespread. And it did in certain instances when things happened. But now... It's a sign of disrespect because even though it may be, well, it, it always has been a sign of disrespect, but even though everybody may know by now that it's a work and it's prearranged or it's choreographed or whatever, it still ain't fake or elsewise all these people wouldn't be having spinal surgery and dick fusion and whatever the fuck else they're going through. It's more painful, more dangerous and leads to shorter careers now and more major injuries than it ever has been. So you, the, the, there used to be in called entertainers, which I still, you know, fucking gives me the sour belches, but fuck fake in any respect. Try and, and, and like theory said, you try to do what I do for one fucking day. You little Weasley motherfucker. See how fucking much crying you do. And the guy does seem very weaselly. You have to see the video here. Is this something you could train wrestlers in how to react, like how to react to this if it comes up? Not everyone does media, obviously, but there's a difference between talking to, you know, a wrestling reporter and talking to real press. If they start insulting you, if they start throwing around the word fake, should these guys be trained? Are they trained to know how to deal with that? Well, I always told the guys in OVW, because we got people on local television here with the stations when we were promoting things. And, you know, the, none of the stations were going to go out of their way to do some kind of big expose on Ohio Valley Wrestling. They knew we were going to do a fundraiser for the Crusade for Children or we were working with Six Flags or whatever. But you get sometimes the, the fun-loving local, you know, news personality that'll want to, oh, chop me. Or, you know, or want to make kind of a joke out of it. So I prepare them a little bit. I say, look, if they want you to chop them, say, brother, and you can say this on the air, 
you don't understand. If I chop you and cave your sternum in, if you you or your family don't sue me, your station will because you won't be working for a couple weeks. I said, don't fucking hit anybody except one of the other boys out in public, on TV, or whatever. Secondly, if they say, oh, well, why don't you have a, do a little deal with, you know, so-and-so, our sports guy, show him what a body slam is. Once again, same thing, liability. Our, our trainers won't let us do that because you might be hurt, but also we don't fight if they, if they want an impromptu match. So we don't fight for free. I wouldn't, you know, have them have a match at a fucking in the studio unless we were in control of a situation where we knew the DJ or the personality and we were going to sit down with him. We were going to sell tickets to something. Then we might do a little gaga. But that wasn't just for a fucking local news drop at 8.30 in the morning. And, you know, and I would say you don't have to lie and you don't have to make yourself look stupid. But protect the business at our level. You can say at OVW's level, you can always say, look, the WWE is watching everything that goes on in OVW and they're waiting for the next big superstars. And they're waiting for the guy to pull up to Monday Night Raw and pay-per-view and WrestleMania. And nobody's going to tell me to look bad. I'm always going to be the best I can be. That type of thing. And just deflect. And, and that worked. But when you get, if this guy was being a smart ass or if he just didn't know and he was just being dumb disrespectful, well, he got told off about it. And the, and the theory walked out and didn't do the fucking spot, right? That's right. The video ends with him walking out. How do you think Fury yeah. handled it? I think it was great. He didn't have to fucking hit the guy and get detained by the Australian National Guard or whatever. But he told him off. He put him in his place. And he said, fuck you, fake. Regardless of... He didn't even have to get into somebody's telling me to win or lose. Just fake. Look at me and look at you. And try to do what I do for a fucking day. And you're going to come in here and disrespect me? Dude's talking fucking shit. Fuck you. I'll fucking leave. And then that guy probably got yelled at. Uh, if, if, if Theory said, you're supposed to be in charge of something around here, was he the station manager? Well, then maybe he didn't get yelled at, but if he was just the goddamn on-air you know, show producer for that particular program or whatever, the sales department's going to go to the station manager and go, God damn, they spent all this money, and this guy runs fucking Theory out of the... He'll have heat. That's the way that works. So, you know... I think he did quite a good job, Theory did. Well, that was Austin Theory in Australia. Some more audio here that I have, Jim, that a lot of the listeners have sent in. I know Dave Meltzer has been a popular topic here amongst the listeners, and there have oh, been boy. things that he's done that have been newsworthy lately. I have a clip here apparently from last night's Observer Radio. He's, he's about six months away from being on the sidewalk in a bathrobe. Well, we're going to get... <laughs> We're going to get the full context of this, but here's the short version of what he just said. We're going to get the full context in a moment, but I have not heard this yet. Let me play this audio. You know, poor people don't like AEW. All right. Poor people <laughs> don't <laughs> like AEW. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> wait. He's thinking George Bush doesn't like black people. Wasn't that the quote? Well, that was what Kanye West said before people realized what a nut he was, but it is Dave. I'll play the full context. We could stop Poor it. Poor people don't like AEW. This was posted on Twitter by Meltzer Says What. Let me play some audio here that he posted. Jim, stop it uh, whenever you want. I actually got a listing just this week of essentially all the pay-per-view buys by state from TNA, WWE, and AEW. And it's very interesting because... Um, I think the one thing that's most interesting is for WWE pay-per-views, okay, the people who still buy in pay-per-view. Yeah, for the record, we should say that. The premium live events primarily are distributed or seen on Peacock or various other things, I guess, throughout the world, but the amount of people buying traditional pay-per-views is the smallest it's ever been. Well, yes, I've, I'm still one of those because I like my TV, but I understand that fact. They are most successful in states where the income, the average income is the lowest. 
you would think that people who would pay sixty dollars for a pay per view right. would probably. You okay over there? Wait, wait, w- 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 hold on here. Now, we've obviously just talked about we're talking about a small sample of people because most people don't buy pay-per-view anymore. For WWE. For WWE. But of those people, they're most successful in states where the overall income of everybody in that state, not just you don't have to give your income when you buy the (laughs) pay-per-view. We're talking about these people that bought the pay-per-view live in a fucking state where the overall income is lower than other states is the point he's making. I believe so. I live in Kentucky. I'm about as goddamn a Democrat of a Democrat as a Democrat can be. But we are embarrassingly enough the first state in the goddamn union to turn red to our everlasting shame on the presidential elections. So have I just not disproven his goddamn theory to begin with? Well, let him finish. Again, he's just getting going with his theory. Oh, he's just getting going. All right. Okay. Here is Dave Meltzer's pay-per-view theory. I come from more affluent states than the ones who pay whatever, you know, Peacock is nine ninety nine. I think again, or eight, maybe it's maybe I think it's eight, maybe it's eight ninety nine. I don't even know. And I, I get it, right? You know, but it's obviously nothing. But it's it's just interesting. But for AEW, it's the opposite. You know, AEW, um, you know, the more affluent um, the state is, the better they do on pay per view. And Oklahoma, where they were tonight, is one of the states that um, AEW does not do well on pay per view. It's settled. Wait, wait, Oklahoma wait. is poor. You hear wait. that? Oklahoma is poor. But besides, so now his point is, well, <laughs> they sell way more pay-per-views in New York and California than they do in Oklahoma. Yeah. There's nobody there. <laughs> There's no people, Jerry. What the? F- There's the. He's taking statistics of two different things and putting them together. We don't know whether, goddamn, the people that order a pay-per-view in a specific state are Richie Rich or goddamn Pigpen. And not even the one from the Grateful Dead, the one from Peanuts. Very good. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you think, Dave. Go, uh, go, go ahead. WWE does great on pay-per-view. Um, there are a lot of states... Um, and, and this really does correlate, you know, I mean, when I looked at the states that AEW performs the worst on pay-per-view, and that's the states that they've been running all these shows in, and WWE's doing <laughs> great in those states. Hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> they do worse on pay-per-view wherever they run live events where people, where people have actually seen them and heard about it <laughs> and know what the fucking shit looks like. They do horrible. As soon as people the see them, they say, I'm not going to buy it. Everybody in Oklahoma and Mississippi and Montana and who else, North Dakota, who else could I piss off by being naming states where there's no fucking body there? They've still all heard of the WWE. Everybody has. That's why they purchase those shows if they're wrestling fans. It may take a while for everybody in goddamn Idaho to find out that AEW is even there. And then again, because of the state of AEW's product and the fact that there's nobody in fucking Idaho, they're probably not going to do big numbers there either. But WWE just had 13,000 people in Salt Lake City because everybody knows who the fuck they are. You going to drink Coca-Cola or you going to drink Ben's Discount Cola? No matter what state you live in. On pay-per-view, amazingly enough. So it's, um, it's you know, it's definitely very different places and different audiences that are buying the pay-per-views. And um, they probably, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing, you know, like where they're more popular and where they're not. Um, then tell us the interesting but, part uh, about it. But I think that, like, they they need to be going 
to the states with the highest income because that's where AEW's <laughs> popularity is also the highest. For whatever reason, you know, uh, you know, poor people don't like AEW. Oh my God! I'm not saying rich people do. Well, that's where it uh, cuts off there. What the fuck? They need to sell tickets. They need to go to where people have more money. Oh my, is this like a Sam Kinison routine? That's what I was just, just thinking. That's people. what I was just Move thinking. Move to where the food is. <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> poor people don't like AEW. Maybe poor people like fucking rent and food, a roof over their head, possibly transportation more than they like AEW. Yeah, maybe lower your ticket prices. Good only Lord. rich people are attending the shows. Gee, I wonder why that is. Maybe they can only afford it. Well, I can see the average income of an AEW fan being higher than an average wrestling fan in general because you'd have to at least attain some point to where you have hours every day to get on the internet, try to decipher and understand all these fucking angles and know who all these people are that just pop up on the program and be aware of every indie outlaw name in the history of Japanese wrestling. So you got to be independently wealthy just to put that much time into it. <sighs> poor, poor people don't like AEW. That's a new one. That's a new one. I, I guess also poor people don't like to set their DVR as five minutes late. Well, no, poor people don't have DVRs because they're poor. That's why they can't get into. They gotta. They gotta pirate that cable signal like everybody else and watch it live. What, oh, what, um, I, I, <laughs> is there any further gymnastics or contortionistic policies that he can go through to play a game of wrestling twister to figure out how to align his friends at AEW with the positive attributes of people? Well, AEW fans have more money. They're better looking. Apparently we understand that they marry well and they're well thought of at the country club. You know, he brought up Tulsa, and we're going to review uh, Dynamite on the experience, obviously. They ran Dynamite last night as we are recording in Tulsa, the box center. I, it's a new one on me since I've been there. They had 3,128 tickets distributed. It's their Tulsa debut. WWE's last four times in Tulsa. August of 21, 7,074. January of 22 for Raw. 4,313. Bad night. January 23. Again for Raw. Oh, no, that, that was January 22. This is January 23 for Raw, 6,828. And they just ran SmackDown in October, 10,786. Jesus Christ. And it's a big building. I'm looking at the seating map now. So <laughs> AEW closed off a lot of that building. But are they too poor to go to W? I guess... When SmackDown's there, <laughs> they have the money to go to wrestling, but when AEW is there, they're too poor. Well, poor people don't like it. They wouldn't go anyway. They want to go watch the cockfights and, and shoot some dice back behind Scatman Crothers' place. Hey, you want to go see that Young Bucks wrestle? Nah, man, that's wrestling for rich people. Yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have anything to wear. So that's like the new one of the new arguments, and I guess this will tie into another conversation we'll have Shortly, the idea that AEW fans are somehow better than WWE. I don't even know how to phrase it. It's such a more, weird... More affluent, more accomplished, more discerning. Per cap the is it per capita? I mean, because WWE is such a larger audience. So... Well, no, because this is completely uh, unrelated statistics that he's jamming together anyway, so we can make up any shit we want. It's no, it's not. <laughs> and, and, yeah, but I'm telling you. If you go to the AEW matches, you better not ask them to pass the fucking jelly. Do not say... They let him go. Please pass the jelly. Well, Dave uh, does it again. I don't even know if I should bring up the Adam Page thing now, because it's kind of developing. We'll see what happens on the What's Dynamite. What's developing with him is his, 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 his pregnancy test is fucking turning blue. What's going on with him? In the match you have not watched yet because you didn't watch Dynamite yet, and you got to watch that women's match, too, to see that. Uh, that's oh, another boy. Thing. No, you have to. Uh, those are the rules. You have to. But apparently Adam Page, um, I saw the spot 
and he hurt his ankle, or at least in the ring, it looked like he hurt his ankle and, you know, played into the match a little bit. And he was telling the people he was okay. He can continue the match. Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer reported that uh, here's what Brian Alvarez says. He has to have looked at it and says it could be a broken ankle, but it does appear to be a serious ankle injury. Sometimes we have people getting injured and we don't know anything about it. They don't say anything. But this guy's fighting for the world title in a little over a week. So if he's got a broken ankle, I think we're going to hear about it real quick because they're going to have to come up with something. However, Fightful Select is reporting that the ankle injury was all an angle Ugh. and Paige was fine backstage. So we shall I see. I thought we had some hope for a second of Swerve versus Joe in a singles match that people wanted to see. I thought maybe fate or karma or kismet, you know, or whatever had taken matters into its own hands. But now this could all be part of a carefully orchestrated work to create less interest in the pay-per-view main event than there was before. If George Hackenschmidt could wrestle with a hurt knee, I think Adam Page could wrestle with a hurt ankle. Well, but now think about this. All Hackenschmidt had to do was get in the ring with Frank Gotch. But, you know... Page has got to contend with uh, not only Swerve, but also Samoa Joe. If it had been a three-way with Gotch and Hackenschmidt and Farmer Burns, I don't know, oh. we'd be talking different. Farmer Burns, what about uh, Dr. Ben Roller? I mean, there's so many people that could have gone in there and messed things up. But Well, but if, if, if they'd have called Dr. Roller in, because, you know, he was, he was really a, a hired hitman. He was a mercenary. He'd take anybody's money. But if they called Ben Roller in, I think you would have to guarantee to see a Fred Beal run in and save. There'll be more about all these characters very soon on the show. Trust me on that. We have a lot. We're going to talk about a great book that Jim and I both read. We'll just plug it real <laughs> quick here. Ballyhoo by John Langmead. Maybe the greatest history of professional wrestling ever written. Am I crazy for saying that? I, no, I don't think you are because it sets the stage even for what Hornbaker has done. It predates that and then follows through with the pioneer years to the end of Jack Curley's career when everything's been downhill for wrestling since then. Well, Jim, let's uh, see how far downhill we will go here with the next one. Continuing on the topic of AEW and AEW fans and the behavior of AEW and AEW fans, have you seen anything online about O'Shea Jackson Jr., who's Ice Cube's son? He was the star of uh, Straight Outta Compton, a great movie. He was fantastic in it, playing his dad. That he's been going at it with AEW fans on Twitter? Have you been following this at all? I, I have seen it, yes. I haven't been following it, no. You told me right before we went on the air that Ice Cube's son, and I said, Ice Cube has a son. Um... I have seen, I got to be honest with you. I saw the name O'Shea Jackson Jr., which I was not familiar with. And on Twitter, I think maybe his picture, does he have a baseball cap on? I said, O'Shea Jackson Jr., he sounds like he, he plays for the Reds or something, right? I thought he was a baseball player. And I saw that he had had some comment about, hey, what the fuck to the AEW fans? I'm allowed to ask questions about who the fuck is on this TV show I'm watching. And I didn't know anything more than, than that. And then you said he's Ice Cube's son, and he's apparently a big wrestling fan and an accomplished actor, which I was not. Was he in The Watcher? That's the newest thing I've seen lately. No, I have not seen that. I don't know who's in it, but big wrestling fan. He tweets out stuff. and. I'll play you some audio because it goes into what we really want to talk about here. Here's him talking about what you just referenced, the AEW fans' reactions to wrestling fans, just having conversations about AEW or asking questions yeah. about AEW, anything that isn't blowing AEW. So uh, st I'll stop this whenever you want. Here we go. This is uh, from an interview with Chris Van Vliet. If I'm watching someone on AEW... And I ask, who is this guy? I don't need you to tell me I'm not a real wrestling fan, to tell me how could you not know such and such who did, uh, who gives a damn. Like, I, I need you, all right, inform me, bro. Or at least have your programming in a way to let people know 
why you should love this dude, why you should Boom. fuck with this guy. That's something that I feel like is missing. When you, Conan, when I was on his podcast, he brought up, when you watch UFC and they give you a little backstory about this dude, backstory about that dude, uh, what this guy's had to go through, what he's done, and vice versa. And then they put him in the room and they cuss each other out. And then by watching those videos, you've picked a side yes. of who you're with that's missing from that. What, Hold it, stop what, what, it, stop it. How does this fucking guy, get, can, can they hire him? In AEW, how does this fucking guy who just watches the TV show, auto, and he knows how to fly the plane and the pilots are up there goddamn standing on their heads. He gets it. Yeah, and before I play the rest of this and you can discuss how much he gets here, that is the part of the issue. If you ask a question like, who is this luchador I've never seen before, never heard of before, you're insulted, you're shouted down, you're... They try to almost debase you for not being the level of fan that they are. And you can right. do, and you can try to think about what level of fan they really are. I mean, it's almost a sickness. Well, but also, even if it's it's not being disrespectful for an average fan, we cover the wrestling world. We're supposed to know these people, but average guys watching the TV show, he's speaking for the fans. He gets it. I want not only to know why I'm supposed to love this guy or hate this guy, but then also something that's overlooked is sometimes they pick people that you can't make anybody love them or hate them because they ain't interesting and nobody gives a shit. So, but those are the two things that you have to have. You have to have, you have to pick your talent properly. So people will either dislike them or like them in large numbers. And you have to give them a reason and a presentation to do so. I keep going. I'm loving this guy so far. What they have is this, this, this niche group of people who watch all of these wrestling shows, and they're already in the know. So when they see these names together, it is a dream match for them. But you're trying to sell this to American <laughs> television, baby. You got to movie that up a little bit. You got to give me some, some cinema to follow. You know, wait, some, wait, some... you got to movie that up a little, baby. You got to movie that up a little, baby. It's, a, it's the same thing we went through with Ring of Honor's fans in, in 2011. They didn't want the company to get big enough to actually make a profit and survive if it meant taking away their fucking, you know, Jack Evans uh, trampoline festivals. You know, who knows what's real and what isn't? But it's an interesting story, the one that the Fullers tell, that when Buddy Fuller was put as the booker, in Memphis by his father and Nick Goulas, that he went around ringside and he, after, I guess, noticing the problem, told all the fans sitting at ringside not to come back ever again. <laughs> that it was them and their reactions and the way they were treating the show that was hurting everything for the company. And he needed new fans to come in there, pissing off all the old oil fans who said, we'll never come back. But he got new fans in there with... Sputnik Monroe, Billy Wicks, and lots of things. Now, again, who knows what's real and what isn't. Well, what you can and can't do. But there is something to be said for the idea we're playing to a very small room. When you go to the big room, the show does change. Yeah, and can I just chime in that 98% of that was due to Sputnik Monroe and Billy Wicks and getting television at the same time and a change in the overall talent roster and the booking philosophy from the previous promoter, Les Wolf. And there were probably, maybe was there a half a dozen wise asses that were causing trouble at the ringside down to Ellis Auditorium that I bet Buddy Fuller did go out there and strong arm, but I don't think he made a grand announcement amongst sections of ringside, right? <laughs> so all of those things can be true. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, y'all, first three rows of section C, get the fuck out of here. Don't have a dark enough for a step again. You cocksuckers have been sitting there on your hands for too long now. You've killed our business. How are things going to Memphis, buddy? I chased away the first three rows of ringside. <laughs> Give me a few more weeks, I'll get the rest of the building empty. And then, then we can really start cooking. <laughs> But not, and, hey, Nick Goulas, they said when he was 
in the 60s when they were turning them away some weeks from the uh, Hippodrome in Nashville. And it was a big crowd, and, and the people were late getting in, and they were. he would stand out in the lobby and cuss the people, God damn it, go on, move on in there, get out, you got your ticket, God damn it, get on in there. <laughs> Shove them in the fucking doors, cussing them the whole way. Get the fuck in there. Oh, God. But anyway, where's O'Shea at? Oh, uh, let's go back to O'Shea. To hold on to besides the announced team uh, running down a list for me while this dude's walking down the ramp. And <laughs> I feel like that's missing. And when you are trying to get involved and, 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 and trying to, to really give something a chance, and when you question it even a little bit, mm. and you get 80 no-faced accounts uh, <laughs> coming at you, at, a, at any given time, you're like, man, fuck this noise, bro. Like, I'm, I'm cool <laughs> off of it. If y'all like it, I don't. And I don't want that. You know, I have people over there that are that I'm cool with, you know. Well, that's the end of the clip there, but. Oh, man, he, he gets it. And oh, oh Chris Van Vlen, Vlen Vliet, the, the Netherlands' finest journalist, he sounds like Ichabod Crane's partner. Uh, but uh, we appreciate him having. O'Shea on there to say something that is elementary wrestling logic and that almost nobody has the capability to grasp. But you say this guy, he's in the show business also. So he's he's got an entertainer's mindset looking at this, so he knows how to attract a crowd for something. And everything he's saying makes sense. It's what we say, it's what other people who logically, who watch wrestling hoping it'll make sense even if it's a wacky world. But AEW fans got triggered. We have a few tweets here that were uh, sent over to us. Someone named Drugs Delaney <laughs> tweeted out and tagged Ice Cube. Man, I never wished Ice Cube pulled out more in my life than when this sped was conceived. To which Ice Cube responded, <laughs> okay. Fuck your wishes, bitch ass drug head. <laughs> Then, well, I'm glad Ice Cube has the time to <laughs> s slip, flip through Twitter and come to his son's defense, but uh, what the fuck? <sighs> and then uh, O'Shea Jackson Jr. himself uh, tweeted out, Motherfuckers wishing I was never born, because I think AEW and the fans should welcome more people who aren't in the know. And then he makes a big, ah, cry more. IWCD's nuts. You fucking worms. <laughs> well, it's a, a, a boy. Welcome to the club, O'Shea. Me and Brian have, have got everything ready for you here. All the tablecloths are out and everything. We've been in the same position for a long time. When we state the fucking obvious, and every, oh, you're goddamn so horrible. We hope you die. Well, we will uh, stay on top of this uh, developing story as it develops more <laughs> in the future. If it develops anything, I don't think anything's and developed. And now, is Ice Cube's name O'Shea Jackson? I believe so, yes. Well, that would, mean, that would be why O'Shea Jackson Jr. would be his son then. See, I didn't know his real name was O'Shea Jackson. Well, you're not really into rap. But you know, I don't got to call him Junior. <laughs> well, there you go. Jim, another story breaking as we are recording here. I have an article here from Insider Gaming. Exclusive... Brock Lesnar's WWE 2K24 status. Obviously, people have been wondering what's going on with Brock Lesnar in the game. Wait a minute. Actually, I have a recording of that status live. And that was over the toilet. But here's uh, what it says here. Brock Lesnar is in WWE T... T WWE 2K... T T ah! I'm adding T's for no reason. Brock Lesnar is in WWE 2K24, but you won't be able to play as him. What? Well, how, how does that even work then? Multiple sources have told Insider Gaming that while it was too late to fully remove Lesnar from the game, the plan shifted to simply make him unplayable for players upon release. So wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that means that he's refused to do business with anybody that buys the game. He won't put anybody over. Despite being unplayable, his characters and game files are still within WWE 2K24 or 24. 
That means that there will be ways for those with the ability to get him to become playable. It'll just take some work to make it happen. As far as why he's not just removed from the game, there are a couple of reasons. The biggest reason is the fact that it was so late in the game's development when the latest allegations against Vince McMahon arose that it also implicated Lesnar, though he was not mentioned by name. Another is it's possible that he has minor inclusions within different game modes. Insider Gaming has reached out to over a dozen contacts at 2K through various methods for comments on Lesnar's status within the game, as well as what sources have said. As of writing, each request has gone unanswered. <laughs> the closest to an answer has been a rep passing along what the company says is the full roster with Lesnar not included. The story is still developing, and uh, that's really it. It's launching March 8th, the game. Is that, are they, getting, like, remember when they used to sell things for kids and games and toys and stuff, batteries not included? Are they now going to put up a, a graphic, Brock Lesnar not included? You got to get him separately from the black market. Uh, I don't know, being just a small town bird lawyer, I don't know about all the terminology you talked about, playable character and download of all that stuff. But apparently they have minimized his presence and his utilization ability in this game as much as they possibly could without you know, but tearing a thing apart and starting from scratch, I guess, is what it sounds like, right? What do you do with Brock? He's not being sued. He's not being... I mean, he's being accused of things without naming him, allegedly, in the suit, but not as a party to the suit, and nothing ended up... Other than the video, I guess, being sent, there was no physical interaction between the two parties, between Janelle Grant and Brock Lesnar. Well, but and, and I mean, still, technically, we have, we have the lawsuit's statement that a video was sent. We haven't seen the video, nor do we... Nor do have, we want to. Do, well, no, but no, we don't have third-party acknowledgement that this is a fact. This is what's alleged in the lawsuit. But here's my problem with old, with the Brockster. With everybody else, it was corporate officer number one or executive number one or legal department guy number, you know, love potion number nine, whatever the fuck, right? Strawberry letter 23. Ah, but there was one... Shucky Otis. There you go. Brothers but Johnson. And bam! They did a... There was an instrumental, bam. Oh, I didn't know that one. Also, and Rido Rocket. But nevertheless, Brock Lesnar was not named by name, but it the, the description was such a narrow description that would only fit pretty much him that that's what people ran with. And one would have to think that if Brock Lesnar, because now he's, he was off WrestleMania and off the elimination chamber, he was out of the Royal rumble. We talked about that on a show a week or two ago, those three days right there, that's a few million dollars he's lost at minimum. And now if he's out of this game, does that mean, I don't know how their royalty system works, but if he's in there only reluctantly because they didn't have time to take him out and he's not featured or involved in any of the advertising, I would imagine that affects his royalties in some fashion. Uh, if you were Brock Lesnar and you were not the guy being referred to in the lawsuit, would you not have had your agent or attorney make a public statement saying, hey, fuck all y'all. It's not Brock. We can prove it's not Brock, and we intend to do that. Or would you ignore the whole thing? Because what else are you going to say? Well, God damn it. Yeah, it's Brock, but we think her lawsuit's bullshit, and Brock was a victim of Vince's. It might work with Laurinaitis being a goddamn victim of an 80-year-old fucking senile sex pest, but I don't think people would have a lot of sympathy for Brock Lesnar, multi-million dollar UFC fighter and fucking badass being forced by his employer that he works for twice a year to fucking make nasty nasty with uh, an employee. So 
he, he, the time for saying, hey, it wasn't me. I wasn't even there. It's this guy over here. To me, has passed, has it not? Don't you have to deny something that's that widespread, that's getting that much attention and causing people to pull out on you unless there is something to it? Well, that's part of the thing, too, because if not now, when? For Brock Lesnar, if you're not going to bring him back now because all this is happening, how are you eventually going to roll him back in there without it being a topic of conversation? It has to be addressed at some point. I don't know. I don't know he gets rolled back in at this point. How old is Brock now? Early 40s? Well, he was in OVW 24 years ago now. Mid 40s? So it's not like he does this for the love of the game. He does it for a lot of money. Do they want to pay him a lot of money anymore based on the fact that he may bring more negative attention for the foreseeable future than than positive, and they've got a bunch of stars? And by the time that this wears off, if it ever does, will, will Brock be, you know, will he be worth how many million dollars that he demands to show up and do whatever the fuck he's doing? He's a, still a tremendous performer, but... How long you got to take off over something like this? Or do they, do they give a shit? Are they like, well, fuck, here's the, the, he is, Brock could never be an announcer. We talked about CM Punk being an announcer for WWE and UFC because he's got experience in both. Brock couldn't announce a fire at a crowded theater. But he's still a Hall of Famer in both goddamn genres and now the same company owns it. He could make a fucking fortune over the next couple of years if he hadn't gotten himself in deep shit, potentially, allegedly, being involved in shit that he should have known better. Well, it wasn't shit. It was piss, but that's a whole Well, no, what, but what did the put it? If you wanted to fucking get some goddamn something going on on the road or whatever the fuck, why would you want Vince involved? Isn't that a goddamn hard-on killer right there? I mean, just the thought of that alone. I don't care if it was goddamn the, the sexiest woman on the planet. If Vince is involved. Just talking to Vince about sex has to be awkward. Did you, no, no. Oh, hooty hoot, hooty hoot. I don't even think. Goddamn, it would turn me into a fucking monk. And you know, one other thing, we brought up the nail story the other day. You gotta remember, Nails Kevin Kelly was a tall blonde guy. Maybe Vince has a type. Oh, come on. He had Laurinaitis with him. Maybe he has a type. He did. Nails was a tall, blonde guy. Yes, I'll agree with that. So was fucking Michael Myers under the mask, maybe. I, but He didn't work At there. the same time, he had a goddamn face. If you had a face like Nails' is, you'd fucking shave your ass and walk backwards. All right, well, we will stay on top of this story uh, in the weeks ahead, Jim. Jim, another big story breaking. Over the last day, last night, or uh, yesterday. Which which one is it? <laughs> well, yesterday night. Did this happen in broad daylight? If so, what hemisphere? It was after 6 p.m. on the East Coast, so I believe that is, in fact, evening. The Soap Opera Network was the first to report. Here's the article <laughs> by Errol oh, Lewis. Soap Opera Network is now breaking wrestling-related stories. Veteran producer and director Jennifer Pepperman joins AEW as vice president of content development. And uh, let me go over here because I have, I believe, a statement. Vice president of content development. AEW, here's an official statement, announces Jennifer Pepperman as vice president of content development. Three-time Daytime Emmy Award winner will work (laughs) alongside AEW CEO and head of creative Tony Khan on development of content for live programming. The date, February 21st, 2024. Once again, AEW CEO and head of creative, he dropped GM, Tony Khan (sighs) announced that award-winning, this is exactly what the previous paragraph was, a professional wrestling producer and senior writer since 2017. (sighs) Pepperman was a prolific director and executive producer of renowned soap operas including As the World Turns, One Life to Live, and After Forever. Never heard of that one. Pepperman has won three daytime Emmys for Best Directing across her career, 
bringing decades of experience in production and directing. And she was the nicest woman in the women's prison. Bringing decades of experience and production in production and directing to <sighs> AEW. Peppermint will work alongside CEO and head of creative Tony Khan in the development of content for AEW Dynamite, live every Wednesday, AEW Rampage on TNT every Friday, and AEW Collision live on TNT every Saturday. <sighs> Here's a quote from Tony Khan. Ah, uh, there's gotta be. Adding Jennifer Peppermint's brilliant mind to the AEW team <laughs> opens the door for exciting new ideas and will help oh. us build upon the incredible stories currently developing on the road to AEW revolution <sighs> across our three weekly shows on TBS and TNT and the effects of Jennifer's arrival in AEW will be felt for many years in the future. We're thrilled to welcome her today and I look forward to her creativity and collaboration with our team across the board in what will be AEW's biggest year yet and beyond. <laughs> to infinity and beyond! There it is, Jennifer Pepperman, the Vice President of Content Development, will be working alongside Tony Khan, from what we understand. She and his team. And his team. She previously was a WWE writer, apparently very close or worked a lot with Sasha Banks, oh which boy. has led a lot of people to wonder if that's played a role in this job or that i guess her coming in oh is... well that makes sense then because of the the boss is gonna do big business in boston and uh and and all of a sudden here comes alexandra pepper day to be part of the writing team so before you either get you either get your your son a job or your best friend a job or your brother-in-law a job or now you get your favorite writer a job I guess there's two questions here. One, with all the problems in AEW right now, do you need someone who's a writer? I know she worked in WWE for several years. Those were several years under Vince. Well, and if she's gone and lost influence here of late, that may be a positive thing as to why the show has gotten better. Less of these fucking women's fucking dramatic soap opera fucking directing bullshit and more goddamn wrestling booking. Look, at here's the fucking soap operas and you daytime Emmys. Okay, not to, again, belittle talents that Alexandra Pepperday potentially has. She may be talented at directing soap operas and at winning daytime Emmys. So go out there. My Uncle Tommy used to love to listen to the stock car races on TV and the Indy 500 and the Daytona 500 and all them 500s, all them car races. And whether it was Mario Andretti or Bobby Unser or that whole crew, he, they were the greatest automobile drivers on the planet. But I would be willing to say if you took one of those automobile drivers out of the automobile and stuck them at a goddamn Delta 747 and said, here, drive this fucking thing, it's exactly the same, there would be some differences. So that's the problem with the WWE for the past 20 fucking years. And now that Tony has another star that's going to dictate to him how he spends his money, and it's not a nepotism hire, but it's just, oh, hire my favorite fucking writer. Uh, director of soap opera. She gonna call some finishes. I mean, everybody at AEW could learn something about television from anybody. Probably, mostly, O'Shea Jackson Jr., as we've seen. But come on, this is... QT Marshall is Toots Mont next to Alexandra Pepper Day because at least he's actually been in the ring, done some finishes, trained to be a wrestler, had some experience with it. This woman has got stuck on the writing team when the WWE was at its absolutely phoniest show busiest and she's never been involved with any other wrestling fucking promotion. So she's going to go in there and think Tony Khan is a fucking insane lunatic and all of these other wrestling people are lower budget and look like Ned next to all the other weird wrestling people that I worked with in the WWE. And that's going to be that. So there's two different issues. One, 
AEW needs a lot of help. The idea you need a writer or a soap opera writer coming in there to infuse emotion or badly scripted things in these segments, that's certainly a step in the wrong direction. But the idea that someone, may it be Miss Pepperday or whoever, is coming in to fix the women's division, you know, at what point do you realize... They, did, they didn't say that, though, did they? They didn't. That's what a lot of people were thinking. The women's division's a disaster and shouldn't even be there, but now they're signing. They're about to make a major signing with Mercedes Monet, so it's not going anywhere. Okay, but how can Miss Pepperday fix the women's division, which, again, it's like hiring an opera coach to take your gymnastics team to the Olympics. What background would Miss Pepperday have that she in any way could make wrestling fucking interesting? or real, or teach these fucking girls how to do it, how to work, how to do finishes, how to do angles, and they didn't even say she was coming in for the women's division, they're probably going to have her run around telling the boys what to do. And that'll be interesting. It'll be very interesting, but again, that's part of the problem, throwing more time and money at the women's division. Again, you haven't seen Dynamite yet. you got to see the Madison Rain deanna Perrazzo match. And Madison Rain's one of the trainers. Like, she's an agent or whatever there. Yes. And you got to see that match. And the crowds go silent during all these matches. We'll see if infusing storylines and more time into it's going to help anything. I don't know if it will, but... If it was, if it was a choice between Alexandra Pepper Day and Commodore Schmidlap, I'd have brought, a, brought on Commodore Schmidlap. Well, again, they've been making some moves. QT Marshall returns. Rocky Romero hired. Now Miss Pepperday will be joining the ranks. Interesting things happening. What a lineup. Boy, I tell you, I'm shaking in my boots right now. I don't want to start no wrestling promotion opposite that murderer's row. Well, Jim, let's get a few more things in here this week before we wrap things up. Wrestle Votes, who I believe has broken some news stories in the past, tweeted out this morning. Sources within WWE indicate that there is an interest in collaborating with Sylvester Stallone for WrestleMania in some form. <laughs> While any communication status is unclear, I'm told there's hope for it. Whether it ultimately ends up happening or not is to be determined. Stallone, born in New York City, gained fame through the iconic Rocky films deeply associated with Philadelphia. Additionally. Stallone is no stranger to the WWE, having inducted Hulk Hogan into the Hall of Fame in 2005. What are your thoughts tying in uh, Sylvester Stallone, Rocky, with WrestleMania? I'm glad they reminded us who Stallone was. It would have slipped my mind there if they hadn't given us that refresher, but um, I laughed when I heard that because it's fucking six weeks away. You know, these deals generally take a little bit more time and they're set up a little bit farther in advance. It obviously makes sense because of the Rocky Philadelphia tie-in, but also did I see a commercial somewhere or something? Is there a new Stallone family reality show? Has he got daughters? Uh, it, I saw him with a bunch of young girls in some type of family setting. So if that's the case, because normally you'd say, well, yeah, they want Sylvester Stallone. I want goddamn, you know, Howard Hughes, whatever. But if he's got something to promote and with as big of a presence as the TKO umbrella now has in Hollywood and with the agents and all that stuff, they may be able to put something together and he might be there. It's not certainly not as preposterous as it might once have been years and years ago. What do you think about doing something like that to tie into WrestleMania, whether it's videos of him talking around Philadelphia, wrestlers reenacting scenes from Rocky or running up the steps, <laughs> whatever it may be. Let's try not to have any of the wrestlers reenact scenes from Rocky. Should uh, they have him and CM know, Punk have a backstage confrontation because Punk never watched a Rocky film? I don't know that probably that Stallone would say that creative works for him, brother, the idea that any major human being on Earth has not seen a Rocky film. but. Uh, it, it, Stallone, as we've talked about, has always been respectful of and appreciative of what the guys in the business do. From Paradise Alley, Terry Funk had good things to say about him from a variety of times he'd worked with him. You know, all the boys that have been around Stallone said he, he 
He shot down the stunt men one time when they were trying to take the piss out of the guy. Say, hey, you try to do this shit in one take with people on all four sides. Stallone gets it. He's he's with it in that respect. I just don't know that he loves the business enough that he would do just any old appearance, as I mentioned, you know, just to be a part of it, unless it was he's promoting something or there's there's a movie or there's some large cash payoff or all of the above that you don't just get Sylvester Stallone to drop by, I wouldn't think. But they have the wherewithal to do all of those things now, so that would be cool to see Rocky in Philadelphia. It, it, I would they think, should have Mr. T attack him. Oh, come on. I would think we would see Rocky, Sylvester Stallone in a Rocky-esque setting or the Rocky character himself. Well, no, you won't see that. Well, the, the Rocky, you know, the, the, the boxer type, the underdog. I can see a cold open being artfully done about Cody finishing his story with Rocky's climb. You see where I'm going with that? Because there's some kind of feud with him and Irving Winkler, who is the producer of Rocky and owned the rights to everything with Stallone. Well, yeah, Stallone they wouldn't have to... Kind of, wait, here's Rocky Balboa now, too, but if if Stallone was kind of, you know, sweaty and in a boxing gym and looked like Rocky and voiced over the thing, yo, you got to climb the mountain or whatever, and and did something like that with Cody or with the theme of the WrestleMania, you could see something like that, and then he could come out in the stadium and people would applaud him and make over him. I don't know. The, how old is Sylvester Stallone now? I'm 62. He's got to be 75, doesn't he? At least probably closing in on 80. So I don't know that we need to see him throw the knockout punch like, you know, former boxers or people who fancied themselves boxers would at one point in wrestling. But yeah, who knows? Eh? Maybe they want to have Stallone to make sure that they break Vince's record for the oldest motherfucker to get in the ring at WrestleMania. Jim, a story breaking as we are recording. Oh, I hate when these things happen. Andrew Zarian on Twitter is reporting that AEW will hold the Forbidden Door pay-per-view, that's their joint pay-per-view they've done with New Japan in the past, at Arthur Ashe Stadium in New York City this June. Oh! <laughs> Seems like a rather ambitious move. What do you think? Well, how, how many times have they done a stadium now? Twice or three? I I want to say three, but it may have been twice. Didn't, didn't they do 20,000 and then 10,000 and then 6,000? It was somewhere along that sliding like, scale, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, you can look at it this way also. You got the biggest population center by far in the United States of America within 100 miles in any direction of Arthur Ashe Stadium. If anybody... <laughs> In the country knows who all these unknown Japanese guys are. It would be people around there. So, but it is in Queens, and you know, are you going to get twenty thousand up? Well, the other thing is, everything in New York is not rosy right now. Going to Dave Meltzer's points earlier, you think maybe there are too many poor people in the greater New York area for AEW to have a truly successful stadium event? You know, I noticed that when I was up there a few years ago. Last time I went to New York, I couldn't believe it. That I saw poor people. It's like they're everywhere. and They other, only like WWE, though. Well, that's the thing. Other endeavors and entertainments and lines of work, they go on chugging right along like nothing's going on, but it's it's hurting the goddamn AEW business with all these poor people. So again, AEW, the stadium show, they've run New York several times. They do a fairly okay job of, at least last time they did with MJF all over the New York media. Well, he won't be on it. You don't think so. We We wouldn't think so, but... It's in June. Typically, the other event has been, I think, in September, maybe. And it is a joint show if it's Forbidden Door. Either New Japan or CMLL, we'll see. Oh, my God. What? No. Look, number one, if they're trying to do a Forbidden Door, the CMLL guys can come and they can be a part of it. But if it's only AEW and CMLL on the other side of that door, nobody's going to grab the knob. The problem, too, is every time they do a Forbidden Door, Tony signs up every wrestler that walks through the door. New Japan well, yeah. gets left with nothing. And, and then they're all around all the time, and then they're, you know. But no, this door, it has to have the New Japan guys to be more than a 10-cent fucking stall and a truck stop. Because of all of the wrestling fans in the United States of America, I think we can all agree on, this is not an inflammatory or a controversial statement, 
most all of the fans that know who the New Japan wrestlers are and what they do and that New Japan is a thing are also watching AEW. But that would be, I think, safe to say. You would think, yeah. So if they get a show in the biggest population area where most of the people will know who these people are and they will take them as dream matches instead of cold matches with people they've never heard of, it would be the New York metropolitan area. But they will find out that for the CMLL crossover to be in any way impactful to the live gate, they better be in Southern California or somewhere in Texas. Because that is, it's, I'm sorry, but you, then you're, you're, even though you're in New York, it's a further niche product, a niche of a niche. And it's not even established. And the way Tony establishes things is probably not going to be. So it's going to be more Japanese guys coming over from New Japan. And for those who like that kind of thing, that's the kind of thing those people like. And it's going to do the same pay-per-view numbers because that's who buys the pay-per-views. Regardless of how much money they have or earn, apparently the AEW fans, 100 and, what, 20 to 40,000 of them can afford the pay-per-view, no matter how many times they do it because that's the number that they sell of every one. But they would be testing that strategy in... in a stress test, to say the least, to do a crossover with just AEW and CMLL, that would be, I would think, a low point for them in terms of buy rates. Well, the other thing that'll be interesting to watch will be Grand Slam, which has been the annual event every September. They said they're going to keep doing them. You can't do it. I wouldn't think you could do two back-to-back -back stadium shows in New York within three months. And apparently, from what I'm seeing online, Andrew Zarian previously tweeted out that it was going to be at the Louis Armstrong Stadium, which is in the same complex as the Arthur Ashe Stadium. Now, wait a minute. Now, hold on a goddamn second. Now, I may not be an expert, but I'll guarantee goddamn to you that I know for a fact that Louis Armstrong never played one set of competitive professional tennis. Well, there is a Louis Armstrong Stadium in Queens. It's in the same complex. It's right by City Field, the home well, of the Well, what York did Mets. Louis Armstrong have against Arthur Ashe trying to steal his thunder? I don't. I think they're not competing. They are part of the same family. And I guess the question no, is... No, no, no. I No, now that's and that's a racist remark to make. It's not in any way a racist Arthur remark. Ashe I don't know what ridiculousness you're trying to do right now. Louis Armstrong are not related in any way. Nor did anyone say that, but again... You just said it was a... No one said any of this! What the hell are you talking about? We're talking about Grand Slam. Oh, And okay. apparently Grand Slam was going to be, allegedly, in a stadium in Queens, and that tweet has now been taken down. So the question will be, do they run two stadium shows in three months, or do they move Grand Slam out of New York? I think they just ought to just buy Arthur Ashe Stadium and run every show there. <laughs> well, there's a lot of rich people in the New York area. I think that'd be a good Well, there point. you go. That's where all their fans are. And they could give they could pass out free opera glasses and spats on the way in the door for all those people that come to fucking view the artistic festivities. And yeah, and by the way, the concession stand, they're changing the food. I understand no more hot dogs and hamburgers. Now they're going for fancy stuff. Sea otter pate and penguin flanks. No, they go the other way. They keep the hot dogs, but they make them 20 bucks a dog. Well, that's a mere bag of shells for rich folks. Bag of shells, $50. Well, that's even bigger. A big bag of shells? A big $100. bag of shells. $100. You got to carry those shells back to your car, though. It's a pain in the ass. The entertainment of this program, priceless. <laughs> no, there's a price, $0. <laughs> But again, what are your thoughts? The AEW Stadium shows, Tony keeps promising this will be the biggest year ever. They have Wembley coming up. Now they're announcing a new stadium show for Forbidden Door in the New York area right at the kickoff of summer in June. It'll be interesting to see how many people travel into this area for that, but what are your thoughts? When, during the history of AEW, has Tony ever said it was going to be a bad year? Well, it's... It's been a long December, but there's reason to believe that this year could be better than the last. There's been multiple press scrums where you're like, man, he's really got to say something. Everything's really going wrong. And he's like, I just want to say this is the greatest event we've ever done. This is the greatest show. 
Everything's great. This is the greatest year. Next year is going to be better. That's the thing. A, a, a broken clock is right twice a day, and Tony has, in the past, he's sometimes been right. They had a better year or whatever, but he's said that consistently all along, whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. So we take that out of the equation, because what's he going to say? Well, boy, whoa, we're in the shit this year. God damn it, I don't know what I'm going to tell my dad. No, he's saying it's going to be bigger and better, because, and in his mind, he believes it because he believes his booking is good. He thinks this talent is good. He thinks everybody wants to see these, whatever the fuck it is he's doing. And he's ignoring the metrics that they... The repeat business is down. We predicted it from the start because two factors, basically. Number one, once you have seen the guys do their shit in this company, there ain't any shit left to do. You've seen it. Yeah, they've had and, five years to get these guys over to another level. It hasn't happened. Well, that's the thing. They're still coming to see stunts, and they've got no more stunts to do anymore because they've done all the stunts. If if people were coming to see the personalities, the WWE, as we've mentioned, the people are leaving their homes, driving, parking, paying, and sitting in a fucking crowd to hear people that they believe their stars talk to them. They don't even have to have matches. And on the other side, they they the repeat business is blah because it's the same shit all the time. There's no person they've got to buy a ticket to see there's no issue they've got to be there to see resolved or continued or whatever it's just a bunch of people are going to fly through tables well they did that last time we've seen it and it's going to rain next tuesday that's their repeat business and we've said that since the start how are you going to sustain uh, the world's biggest crowdfunding uh, project that has been aew since the start because there were enough disgruntled fans that hated Vince McMahon and the really bad WWE product that they wanted to see something else. So they, they would spend their money and buy tickets when they weren't going to the show. We want to support these underdog, the underdog with $10 billion. Well, now it's five years. The underdog's still spending his dad's money just fine, but rent ain't any cheaper. So some of these people are going, I guess they're doing well enough on their own. And many of them have said, and it's kind of been a fucking disappointment. And some of them are saying, well, goddamn all their fucking stars that we wanted to see are hospitalized or off the show. And some of them, they've run 20,000 seat buildings for a crowd of a fucking charity church picnic. And that looks bad and gives the perception that they ain't cool and they ain't happening. And all of these things feed on themselves. So you've got a disinteresting product with half the number of stars and a lackadaisical presentation in front of small crowds. So no, I don't think they ought to be running two stadium shows in the same city in this country or any other country in one year. I think they've... They've got what they're about going to get for Wembley unless they pull out the reanimated corpse of goddamn Dick Sheikat. Eh, I don't know if he could draw in 2024. Well, I'm need going time back to build to, him up. You need a good promoter, a good book. I'm going back to Ballyhoo. Well, then let's let's shock Jack Curley back to life while we're at it. But that's the the point is this that Tony, instead of trying to address any of this shit and get something going in a positive manner, everything's great. Let's hire some soap opera directors and let's run some more stadiums with some more Japanese wrestlers. Well, that'll just right the ship. Should Tony announce with this new hire that they have drawn the biggest crowd ever for soap opera wrestling? Well, I I think they'd have to do some research before they could say that with a full-throated endorsement. You never know. The midgets are beating them over on the other channel. You think Raphael Morphy will come by to visit from Brooklyn? Is it well, he's uh he found an escape hatch. <laughs> Apparently, he's he signed him up to wrestle in fucking every major airplane hangar in the United States and then took a job where he didn't have to fucking... You know, we joked for so long about what he was doing to their schedule, how he would book them for long excursions in California or Texas or Canada. 
And now we're hearing those are also the places where the pay-per-views went down. <laughs> it, just, <laughs> it just doubles down on like how bad a job that guy did. Well, no, I'm telling you, I think the pay-per-views went down because the people had seen the shit live. I think there was a cause and effect in that direction. You know, you can't copy WWE, but I think the lesson of the last year has been for a wrestling company to succeed to new levels in the States. It's about the characters and it's about the stories. Then you got to worry about the actual matches. You want everyone to be competent in the ring, but when it's just a dream match, because I like the way both guys do drop kicks, you can only do that so many times. Well, that's ridiculous. That's why the fans were never allowed to book the fucking matches, because that's what you would end up with. And then the business would go to shit, because what the fans, traditionally, even in the territory days, what the fans would tell you they'd want to see, on occasion when they would get that, it wouldn't draw. But if the promoter and the booker followed their path and their plan and the talent they had faith in and a fucking angle between these people that would make the fans realize, oh, shit, we want to see that. That's when you had a success because then you could control it somewhat. And Lawler used to tell me when he was booking in Memphis, he said, God damn, all I hear when I pull up the Coliseum or I pull up at Channel 5 is, come on, Jerry, we... We're tired of the same old faces. Get some new wrestlers. Then we get all new wrestlers and nobody comes. You guys, it's, it's, it's not what the fans want to see. It's what you are able to convince the fans that they want to see. That you can provide for. They might want to see a bunch of shit that you can't deliver. So the idea is to sell them on the product that you're making and selling, not the one that they think they might want to see instead. Well, we will see what happens with AEW in the stadiums. But, Jim, let's end with a non-wrestling story here this week. This has been in the news. I have an article from the New York Post by Richard Polina. Powerball player John Cheeks denied $340 million lottery jackpot over website mistake. What? Have you been following this at all? No, I know nothing about this. The luckless of the draw. A Powerball player claims he was denied a life-changing jackpot worth $340 million despite his numbers matching the lottery website last year, which the company claims was a mistake. Uh, He's now suing Powerball and the DC Lottery. John Cheeks bought a Powerball ticket on January 6, 2023, when the jackpot rose to $340 million, according to a complaint. Cheeks told NBC4, he selected the ticket numbers using family birth dates, missing the live drawing on January 7th, but not in a rush to check his numbers, since the chance of winning the Powerball jackpot is 1 in 292.2 million. <laughs> he claimed, very low, very low odds. He claimed he checked the DC Lottery's website the following day and saw his winning numbers, believing he had become the year's first multimillionaire. I just politely called a friend, I took a picture as he recommended, and that was it. I went to sleep, Cheeks told the outfit. For three days, the DC Lottery website showed his ticket numbers, according to the complaint. The numbers posted on the website, however, differed from those pulled during the live Powerball broadcast. He tried to redeem the ticket at a licensed dealer on the 10th, and discovered none of his numbers matched up to what was drawn live. Cheeks claimed he then went to the D.C. Office of Lottery and Gaming Prize Center to check, but again, was told he's not the winner. Here's a quote. Hey, this ticket is no good. Just throw it in the trash. Cheeks recalled to the outlet, and I gave him a stern look. I said, in the trash can? Oh, yeah, you can throw it away. You're not going to get paid. There's a trash can right there. Cheeks has since placed a ticket in a safe deposit box. His attorney, Richard Evans, says his client was eventually informed by a lottery contractor that they made a mistake. They managed the lottery website and posted the wrong numbers. They said that one of their contractors made a mistake, but we have not seen any evidence to support that yet. Despite Cheeks not having the correct numbers of the live drawing, Evans feels that something needs to be done for his client. Here's a quote. Even if a mistake was made, 
The question becomes, what do you do about that? The jackpot eventually grew to $754.6 million before a ticket holder in Washington claimed the prize on February 6th. In November 2023, Iowa lottery officials blamed human reporting error for posting the incorrect numbers, which was on its site for six hours. But let's uh, talk about this. What do you think? What should be the restitution for this, if any? Well, I'd like to be on, on what's his name? The fellow that got the ticket? Richard Cheeks. I'd like to be on Mr. Cheeks' side. Um, but here's the prize, and they should do something. There should be some kind of consolation prize for giving this guy a goddamn heart attack. But I, I, if the real number, the right number, the correct number, was called out out loud at the drawing, and then they put the, the, or the wrong number on the website for you, I can kind of see where they're going, no, this ain't right. We made a mistake in putting the number on the website. If they mis made a mistake calling out the number when they actually called it out, and then they later on found out, oh, shit, we should have said five, and we said three or whatever, and that made it match Mr. Cheek's ticket, then he's got a big, yeah, yeah, but I don't, I, unless it was called out incorrectly when it was actually drawn and said and, you know, uttered out there, then I think it's one of them things, isn't it? But who watches the live drawing? Like, to his point, most people would just go to the website unless you're staying up to whatever, 11 p.m. I didn't even it. I didn't even know that you could go to a website. I thought you had to go back to the fucking 7-Eleven and scratch the thing off and say, hey, does this... F I've seen people standing in there going, did I win anything? Well, those are scratch-offs. Scratch-offs are different than the lottery, the general You know lottery. how I've saved the most money I've ever saved in my life? No, how's that? Never buying a fucking lottery ticket. Never once, even if it's like a major prize, just to see I've what happens. I've never bought a lottery ticket in my entire life. Because the odds are 249 million to one, I'm going to win anything. I could put that money in a goddamn certificate of deposit, as Mama Cornette would say. But anyway, so I, I can't, I can't uh, uh, fondle Mr. Cheeks' complaint here. Because the real number was was given out at the start, and you think you should get nothing, or you well, get not that, there should be a consolation prize, but not three hundred fifty million fucking dollars. All right. Because what what happens if what happens if the other guy had the 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 guy that had the real number that was counted out or called out? Well, then he'd want the money too. Then you'd have to have a fucking cage match of some description. You know what? That's an interesting idea. Find two son of a bitches walking around with not a lot to live for and miserable fucking lives and make sure they've got a violent crime in their background and then say, instead of the fucking lottery ticket, we're going to let people bet on the exact second that one of you kills the other one and that person's going to win the $350 million, and you're going to get $350 million too. And then, and then put the fight on pay-per-view. Well, we'll see how it does in the poor areas versus the uh, rich fans of AEW. But Jim, with that, hold on. Old school. The drive through is closed. Thank God that's back instead of that annoying modulator that you've got. Yeah, that one. All right, well... The Martian Death Ray. Well, no, that was more of a silent cinema organ. But we'll be back on the Jim Cornette Experience before you know it, before we know it, wherever you find your favorite podcast, and right back here next week on this show, of course... I wish your organ would be more silent. Hey, don't talk about my noisy organ. What? <laughs> it does. It makes a noise late at night when it drips, especially. You can hear it. In... Go through the archive. If you want more of this, go through the archive patreon.com slash cornet going back to 2013 patreon.com slash cornet only five dollars a month the official the official ah. jim cornet youtube channel just go to youtube and search for jim cornet it'll come right up with the exclusive travis huckle artwork and so much more the official jim cornet youtube channel follow you jim just call him travis huckle i said heckle i thought it said huckle
You can follow Jim Huckle on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. The 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com. And of course, the wrestling news each and every day. Get it directly from the wrestlingnews.com or Arcadian Vanguards, the wrestling news, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Cornette's collectibles at jimcornette.com. What's going on, Jim? Action figures. Take action, get your figures. At jimcornette.com. Of course, the drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 877 50 Steve. What do you got to say about that? I've got to say that's the first time you actually read the number the way it's supposed to be, instead of all those meaningless numbers that people can't process. I believe it's 877 50 Steve. I believe it would be 507 8383, technically, but <sighs> yes. Get even with Steven at newlawoffice.com. I want to get even with whoever gave him that last phone number. But until the next Jim Cornette experience in a day or two, whenever this is coming out, and next week right back here on this show for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Ah, that sucked. Tally-ho!